Good morning, folks. Uh, this is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Uh, it is April 6, 902. We will initiate our day with a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Bogue. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have five, four out of seven commissioners present. Thank you. Um, with that, we have a busy docket. Um, we have our high priority habitat mapping rulemaking today. Um, and then we have an uh, OGDP um, and a couple of other, other matters this may spill into tomorrow. So we will get started. We will start with any commissioner comments. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thanks, Chair. And um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna make this comment a little uh, prematurely, uh, potentially. Um, given that we still have parties joining us this morning, but and I will refresh it ahead of, of the docket at issue. But um, while I worked for Kerr McGee prior to this role as commissioner, um, I, I worked over and participated in discussions about and in planning around and had involvement with KMG's um, area for which they have um, planned and are applying for a comprehensive area plan that's at issue under docket number 21120237. Um, this is a protested matter. Um, we've got three parties involved. And um, while I, I think I could, you know, participate in this matter impartially, um, I do want to acknowledge my prior work and let the parties know that I'm willing to recuse myself should any party object to my participation. So I just wanted to throw that out now for parties to think about, but I will refresh that prior to the docket being kicked off um, later this afternoon or tomorrow. Very good, thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Any other comments from commissioners? Okay, uh, we, correct me if I'm wrong, hearings manager Larson, but I do not believe we had general public comment today. We do have public comment on one of the other matters, and we have public comment on one commenter on the high priority habitat rulemaking. Um, what I suggest that we do is let's, uh, once we get to it, we'll take up high priority habitat. Uh, we'll dip the staff presentation and the CPW presentation, and then insert public comment before we get to the party's comments on that, on that matter. So, uh, um, with that, that brings us to consent agenda. Do, does any commissioner have questions with regard to consent agenda? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion and a second for the discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Consent agenda carries uh, and is approved. We now will move to docket 21120249, high priority habitat map rulemaking. Uh, we have slated uh, initially a staff presentation from both COGCC as well as CPW. Let's get the right folks um, on. The screen. I'm not sure if it's just me, but it seems like Jeff is freezing up on my screen. I'm going to stop video. Can you hear me okay, Commissioner Gonzalez? I can hear you okay. I see All nods right, from may, everyone else. I may just not do screen video for a while. Mr. Duranello, are you running lead for us this morning? Good morning, Chair Robbins. Uh, I believe that I am. I don't see that uh, Director Murphy is, is on the list of panelists yet. So um, I can go ahead and uh, start staff's presentation if you are ready for me. Go for it. Excellent. Uh, let me try and share my screen. Oops. Well, 
once again, after years of doing this, you'd think we'd have it right every time. Um, but that doesn't appear to be the way. And I apologize for my technical difficulties. Let's see. All right, can you hear my screen? Can you, can you see my screen? We can see and hear your screen. Excellent. All right. Well, good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm pleased to be here before you to um, provide staff's presentation uh, regarding the high priority uh, habitat map update for 2022. Um, just to uh, remind you, I'm uh, Greg Bronlow. I'm the environmental manager here at the COGCC. Um, today, you'll hear uh, an introduction and a discussion of the high priority habitat definition from, from me. And then I will turn the presentation over to uh, Dr. Karen Baltura of Colorado Parks and Wildlife. She is the Southeast Region uh, Energy Liaison and has been a great partner to COGCC um, for many years now. Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge and note um, her partners and uh, the, the other regional, the other three regional energy liaisons, um, her uh, CPW's staff, um, wildlife biologists, um, area wildlife managers uh, and subject matter experts um, have also um, provided um, a, a, quite a bit of input into this uh, mapping process, map update process. And many of them are also uh, with us today to um, help answer questions. Um, so following her presentation, um, I'll, I'll come back on and, and talk a little bit about implementation um, and how we're moving forward with the, with the high priority habitat maps. And then um, some closing remarks will be provided by Director Murphy. We will be available to take your questions. You can interrupt us at any time with questions as we go, or we'll provide time at the end um, to take your questions. And um, again, uh, CPW's subject matter experts will be available as well at that time. In 2008, uh, as it implemented the Habitat Stewardship Act of 2007, the commission adopted its rules, into its rules, definitions for two habitat types, sensitive wildlife habitat and restricted surface occupancy habitat. These definitions were quite specific in their detail, but still remain subject to on the ground interpretive conflicts. The individual habitat types were listed out in the 100 series definition. The written definitions were supported by maps which were maintained by the commission. The maps were subject to update no more frequently than annually for restricted surface occupancy and every other year for sensitive wildlife habitat. In practice, only one rulemaking effort was held to update the commission's maps between April 2009, when the House Bill 07-1298 rules became effective, and April 2019, when Senate Bill 19-181 was signed. Meanwhile, CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, maintained current maps of high priority or of habitat areas that they considered a priority for protection. Maps that they used for consulting with federal and local government agents on development planning, maps that they used for their internal decision-making and policy guidance, and maps that they used to execute their mission to perpetuate the wildlife resources of the state. This frequently left a void between the habitat that was managed and protected through the COGCC Form 2A permitting process and that which CPW was intentionally making efforts to protect. The high priority habitat definition was carefully crafted in the 1200 series mission change rulemaking based on learned knowledge by CPW and COGCC and intentionally fills that void. In the first decade of implementing the Habitat Stewardship Act, COGCC consistently relied upon our sister agency to be our subject matter expert, our consultant, and our partner when it came to wildlife resources and habitat decisions. This deference was and remains consistent with the Habitat Stewardship Act. As a result, when coming back to modify, when, when coming back to modify the 1200 series during mission change, we started by looking closely 
at how we defined the habitat we were protecting. And so in the next few slides, I'm gonna walk through that definition in parts. During the mission change, the former flip, split definitions of restricted surface occupancy and sensitive wildlife habitat were eliminated and we adopt a single definition of high priority habitat that would encompass all areas to be considered for protection through the COGCC process. The first sentence in the definition, habitat areas identified by Colorado Parks and Wildlife where measures to avoid, minimize and mitigate adverse impacts to wildlife have been identified to protect breeding, nesting, foraging, migrating, or other uses by wildlife, highlights COGCC's deference to CPW and solidifies our reliance on the mitigation hierarchy, avoid, minimize, and mitigate Im adverse impacts for protection of wildlife resources. This clarifies that use by wildlife for a specific purpose makes a land surface area habitat. But unlike the prior restricted surface occupancy and sensitive wildlife habitat definitions, it does not specify what animals, vegetation types, or buffers are appropriate protected areas. It's important to emphasize that this definition combined with the habitat maps gives us a really good list of species and habitat that all meet the criteria we established during the mission change for creating protection. One, that we have readily available field verified spatial data sets. Two, documented impact regimes associated with oil and gas or other uh, development. And three, we have scientifically validated protection strategies. We know where wildlife is, we know that they are impacted, and we know how to protect. These criteria were critically important in selecting the high priority habitat to be included in the rulemaking for the Habitat Stewardship Act back in 2008 and are just as important for mission change today. The next section of the definition fo focuses on the habitat maps, the maps that are at issue with today's rulemaking hearing. The definition specifies that the maps will be provided by CPW. This makes it clear that the driver of the definition in the habitat are the maps. This allows for habitat to be managed appropriately under other operational rules. For example, habitat areas listed in rule 1202C are treated as no surface occupancy and the habitats listed in 1202D are managed based on the density of oil and gas development within them. And lastly, the habitats that aren't listed in either of the 1202 lists, but are included in the maps are subject to consultation under rule 309 for site-specific management and protection. You will hear later and have seen in pre-hearing statement regarding this rulemaking process that I stated to stakeholders that this map update process could be iterative and that you, the commissioners, could modify the maps based on testimony brought forward today. And I wanna be clear, that's no longer staff's recommendation. In looking at the scope of this specific rulemaking, at the clear language in this definition, and reviewing the statement of basis and purpose for mission change, it is staff's recommend, excuse me, it is staff's recommendation that the COGCC continue its close partnership and reliance upon the maps as developed by CPW. For us to change them here today would recreate the administrative conundrum of multiple management agencies relying on different maps for decision-making that we had hoped to solve through mission change. In this rulemaking, we are adjusting maps that have already been adopted, which makes this a narrow and tailored issue. With that said, for the most part, stakeholders did not bring to their pre-hearing statements or to our stakeholder meeting or to, C or to the CPW or COGCC primary contacts any alternative proposals for maps differing from the CPW maps up for consideration. There were claims made that the science based upon, the science upon which the CPW maps are based is flawed, and there are claims that the process lacks transparency, and there are claims that there are incomplete data displayed on the map. But those claims don't diminish the reliability of the maps used by CPW 
as proposed for update here. As you will hear from Dr. Volterra, CPW does have a robust process and appropriate expertise for developing and updating their habitat maps. And these maps have been relied upon by numerous planning agents and developers in various business sectors. Lastly, and as I've already started to explain, the high priority habitat definition specifies that the maps will be updated periodically, but no more frequently than on an annual basis. It was intentional that this would be a routine process, both in frequency and administration. Minor changes are being documented and recorded by CPW's subject matter experts, biologists, wildlife managers, and energy liaisons based on constant feedback and the department also undertakes a systematic mapping update on a regional basis every four years for each region. Our intent is to capture those updates and keep the commission's maps as up to date as we can. Again, the intent is to avoid the stagnation of regulatory habitat maps as we saw in the previous decade and to ensure that all parties are basing their decisions on the same information. And also included in this year's rulemaking is an administerial change to push the rulemaking notice requirements back to February 28th each year. This mostly just means that our partners at CPW do not have to work long hours over the holidays to update the maps and geospatial data files to get them ready to be sent to the Secretary of State by December 31st in order to facilitate our January 15th notice. Instead, CPW can spend those 60 hour weeks working on habitat mitigation projects uh, for reindeer or other locally appropriate species. So I wanna note that the high priority habitat definition does not include or encompass biological resources. As you've recently heard from the Biological Resources Working Group, wildlife resources are really a subset of biological resources. Therefore, high priority habitat is also part of biological resources. This definition of high priority habitats includes the use of land surface for wildlife migration, and the current maps include migration corridors within many of the 1202D listed habitats, including big game such as mule deer, pronghorn, and elk. However, the definition, maps, and rule 1202C and D lists do not explicitly include pinch points as separate management areas. However, these areas are included in the mission change statement of basis and purpose as areas of concern. CPW is working to address these specific habitat use areas, and we hope that we can incorporate their consideration into our process at a future date. And with that as an introduction, I will now turn it over to Dr. Volterra, again, CPW's Southeast Region Energy Liaison, to discuss the actual maps that are at issue today. She will talk about the updates to various map layers, both within her region and statewide, will provide the scientific basis and rationale for the habitats and habitat updates. And following her presentation, I'll come back uh, and review with you the process for implementation, implementing, excuse me, consultations based on the maps and then we'll be available for your questions along with CPW's various subject matter experts. Um, so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, Dr. Volterra can take over unless you have questions for me. Any questions for Mr. Dorello? Great, thank you very much, Dr. Volterra. Good morning. Um, I'm just rearranging my screens here for a second. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Duranlo, for that um, for that introduction and discussion of the process and definitions. And good morning, commissioners, uh, Chair Robbins and Director Murphy. My name is Karen Volterra. I am the energy liaison for CPW's Southeast region. And I'll be walking us through the proposed um, administrative map updates today for Colorado Parks and Wildlife's high priority habitat. Um, and those proposed to be included in this rulemaking. The maps I'm showing here today uh, were all available on December 31st and issued with the notice of rulemaking. 
Um, these PDF maps were meant to be an overview. Um, they're obviously a little challenging to see some of the details. There was a complete GIS data package uh, released on January 18th, um, available to all parties and the public um, that allowed for more detailed assessment and um, location specific information. So the map shown here includes all uh, triggers um, for uh, high priority habitat, including um, our 1202C, 1202D, and consultation triggers. Green are the existing triggers in the maps. Red shows where there were additions um, in this proposed uh, rulemaking. The, there is, and you, it's very hard to see on these, um, a light green area that shows areas that were dropped, that will no longer be triggers under the new map updates. Overall, there was an increase of approximately 1.8% uh, in terms of consultation acres. However, those are not necessarily independent acres. So we may have an added a consultation trigger that is already in a different map habitat. We have a lot of over overlap, say, with greater sage grouse and elk winter range um, and some other overlapping. So there was um, some increase uh, on that. We do have um, in this notice um, two statewide updates that I want to talk about, and then we'll talk more specifically about the updates to um, CPW's southeast region. This map is another map that was included in the issuing of the rulemaking, and this shows just the 1202C habitats, and these are the habitats that would have a no surface occupancy. Um, overall, there were about 180,000 acres added to the no surface occupancy. The vast majority are bighorn sheep production areas in the southeast region that I'll review in more detail later on. Also the addition of Fisher's Peak State Park, a new state park for Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the state, um, and that added acres again um, to the overall consultation trigger and um, that. So for a closer look, I do wanna start with the two groups of statewide updates, and that is to our raptor nest database and our grouse and prairie chicken habitats. The CPW included two, um, habitat types in terms of protections for grouse um, in the rules. The first were protection of lex, and then the second had addresses on um, production habitat. Lex are um, areas where birds have been seen to be known to be lacking in the previous 10 years. Um, the lek buffers are specific for each species, and they're based on um, the scientific literature and published studies that show not just where would impacts to leks happen, but also um, the le nesting habitat. Um, leks are an indicator of quality nesting habitat, and in many species, those lek buffers are designed to capture approximately up to 50% of the nests within that NSO, meaning there will be no disturbance to up to half or more of the birds nesting. Um, the production habitat then looks at where is the remainder of that nesting habitat and brood raising habitat. And that is habitats are included under 1202D. So those are habitats where we would be looking at density, we would be assessing for indirect and direct impacts um, and assessing compensatory mitigation. That production habitat is a separately mapped layer for lesser prairie chicken and greater sage grouse. For the other four grouse and prairie chicken uh, species in the rules, it's an extended lek buffer. So for some, I think for greater prairie chicken, the lek buffer is 0.6 miles, where their production range extends out to 2.2 miles. So we have those sort of um, layers that add protections um, specific to the type of habitat that is. Um, these are... Um, the lek buffers range anywhere from 0.6 miles uh, to 1.25 miles for lesser prairie chickens. These production areas um, are generally between two and four miles um, from the lek. So again, um, there was uh, the definition of leks in the statement of basis and purpose is a fairly awkward wording, but it's defined as a LEC site as listed in Rule 1202C refers to a LEC with lecking activity in any year during the previous 10 years. Historic LECs, i.e. LECs with no activity within the last 10 years, 
are not included in these rules. Um, that each species has their own definition of what is an active left, what is a historic left, what is an inactive left, unconditional, you know, un, um, unknown, provisional, and even within a species, definitions change by who's managing them. So in order to avoid that, we created this fairly awkward but descriptive um, definition of the lex in these rules. Um, so the description is meant to clarify that those lex included in these layers. There were some party statements um, that mentioned um, the inclusion of historic lex in these databases, particularly in regards to Gunnison's uh, sage grouse. This is a federally listed species, and there are some arguments in favor of protecting this habitat, um, even while it's um, there may not be species observed on it. In order to recover a species, you have to have some place for them to go. Um, internally, CPW has kind of started these conversations, and, and we're looking forward to engaging with parties on this topic, including uh, I think San Miguel County is the one who submitted that statement, and we're happy to answer questions at the end of this as well. However, we do want to note historic leks are not included in this um, proposed update for this year. This actually uh, here shows you the um, lek layers uh, included in the rule, and these would be the updated layers proposed to replace um, the existing maps um, and in the appendix seven of the statement of basis and purpose. LEC surveys are completed each spring, um, specific to the protocols designed for that species. Um, and then the LEC location and then the LEC status, whether there were birds on the LEC or not, um, are updated in our database every year statewide. I do wanna note that this update, it is our first update under the rules, but it does include two years of these statewide updates. So we went into rulemaking in 2020 and we were using 2019 map sets. And so this will include surveys from 2020 and 2021 um, for these LECs. We did see um, an increase in total no, non, no surface occupancy acres, a small 0.3%. There was a very slight decrease for, or for greater sage grouse, um, a slight increase in gunnisons, lesser prairie chickens actually had a 17% increase. Um, and then all the others were somewhere between two and 4%. Um, increase with um, uh, sharp-tailed grouse and plain sharp-tailed grouse and Colombian sharp-tailed grouse in the middle. For the production habitats, there was a slight decrease, however, in production habitat that would be listed under 1202D. Um, for lesser prairie chickens and greater sage grouse, as we said, those layers are independent of lex, and so those had no changes proposed. Um, there are some small increases for gunnisons, about 1%, and greater prairie chickens, um, and a, a significant decrease for protections on plain sharp-tailed grouse of about uh, 25%, although there is actually a small amount of acreage in there. Um, the next statewide update I want to talk about um, is to the raptor nest database. And there were a lot of comments in the pre-hearing statements on this as well. So I do wanna address two things. First, I'd like to go through sort of our process on this and then um, provide an update to the actual uh, work that we're doing, um, that we're proposing for this, for this year's updates. Um, the statewide sources for this data is that we have multiple sources for this data. The primary source is our own CPW database, um, our own biologists, our own uh, monitoring program, uh, where CPW staff and trained volunteers monitor nest locations throughout the state. Um, we maintain detailed nest observations, photographs, and a very structured data collection. We also have um, data shared from our federal land manager partners, primarily BLM and US Forest Service where we share data on these locations as part of our, our long-term management of these, uh, of these areas. Uh, we also have data sharing agreements with groups such as Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and their Bald Eagle Watch program, where we can get thousands of observations in a year um, out of that volunteer program. We also have certain counties, uh, municipalities, or open space programs that have a long history of collaboration with CPW, and are considered trusted data sources. 
These are groups that have qualified wildlife biologists that are responsible for the methodologies and data verification. They are responsible for training any staff or volunteers that work with their program. Um, CPW may have part even participated in some of those training programs. They have known survey methodologies and are considered uh, trusted data sources after years, in some cases, decades of collaboration with CPW. We also have other data sources um, that can come from consultants, developers, operators, um, information provided by the public, birders, citizen scientists, um, information that is provided directly to our biologists or our area offices. Um, NGOs may provide information, land trusts. We have a lot of people on the landscape looking at these things and all of that information can be provided to CPW. In those cases, if it isn't a program that we have this kind of long history with and, and understanding of their process, this data is verified by CPW. It can be field verification. Sometimes all we get is a coordinate or someone said, I was driving down County Road 62 and saw bird, you know, birds looking like they might be nesting. And we'll add that to our list to actually go check. Um, in some cases, particularly from some of the, the consulting companies, we can get a pretty complete data package where we have the qualifications of the observer, multiple data sheets, photos that are date, time, and location stamps showing a bird on the nest feeding offspring. That to us is a pretty well-verified nest and that would be included in our database. So all of these sources, this information is put in our database. It may be a confirmed nest, maybe confirmed active. It may be a possible nest that we've just marked to check. But all of that goes into our database. I think one thing that is a little surprising to people, I think, is how incredibly dynamic that Raptor database is. We have, I believe, over 11,000 nest locations in our database. Of those, about 2,500 are currently determined to be active. Um, but again, we get over 5,000 Raptor nest observations submitted to our GIS department each year. So it is probably of all of ours, the, the largest sort of managed database for that. Nests are frequently destroyed. Uh, this picture here on the cliff is a golden eagle nest that a few weeks later, I think, was found at the bottom of the cliff, had fallen off. Um, so that was destroyed. Um, the nest here, you can see the bottom picture is a ferruginous hog nest. That's a big nest for not a very huge tree. Um, old cottonwoods break all the time, so we have nests that fall. We have species that use alternate nest location, eagles and peregrine falcons in particular may have multiple locations within their sort of territory. So you're figuring out which nest is active, which one they're using, um, are they building a new one? Um, so that can kind of con cause some discrepancies in the data. Um, and some just have not been observed as active in the last five years and again may drop off the database. The proposed high priority raptor nest map um, under this administrative change is a subset of this much larger CPW Raptor database. So all of these locations stay in the database and are updated with status even so that even when sites are no longer active, we still know there was a nest there or there is an inactive nest there. Um, or if another species takes over, if a red-tailed hawk takes over a golden eagle nest, a red-tailed hawk is not on our list of species under um, Senate Bill 181 rules. So that would change and that may be another reason it would drop off. And admittedly, we do not get to each nest every year. Uh, it would be an impossible task, particularly the more remote ones. There are some we have to fly during our aerial surveys to even get a look at these nests. Um, and so, that's why we have, it has to be identified as active once in five years. So that if we don't get it every year, we are more likely to actually catch one of those activities. And in addition, we have some um, data sharing partners who don't want that published in a, in a public facing location. Forest Service uh, does ask that some of their more sensitive nest locations not be revealed um, to avoid impacts from recreations or people just wanting to see it. Um, we have a couple of, I think there was at least one county or maybe an open space that also asks that we not release that data. Other data partners sometimes buffer those locations to a point that we can't put an NSO on that nest. We can't determine that buffer because we don't know the point location. However, there are, the system is built to accommodate that. 
One, we know where a lot of these nests are. We review every permit. When we pull it up, we can identify if there is a nest that is not showing on the COGCC database that is active. If it was not, uh, if we have it listed as destroyed in 2020 and they rebuilt it in 2021, we can catch that lag. The maps we're looking at now were from December 1st. So we already have four months, frankly, of raptor data not included. Um, just by the, the nature of how we do these updates. However, we can access that data. We can be on site. That's where these site specific you know, visits are important to identify that nest may have been empty for 10 years, but there is suddenly a raptor using it. Um, so all of those on-ramps in 309E were written to, to look at these unpublished locations, lags in the survey data and changes in these activities. So while these are meant to be the primary trigger, they are not our only trigger for these raptors. Um, particularly when these thing, when statuses are changing fairly rapidly for some of these for some of these species. So all that was a long way <laughs> to get us to the raptor updates uh, proposed under um, this uh, administrative rulemaking. The um, this again, just like the LEX, includes both 2020 and 2021 data. Um, the biggest gains in raptors were amongst the eagles, um, bald eagles, uh, the bald eagle nest, no surface occupancy buffers, um, increased by about 9,500 acres, about 30%, and that represents a net gain of about 75 bald eagle nests that are in the database that were not there before. Some dropped off, nests were destroyed, and some were added. Golden Eagles also showed a, a, an increase of about uh, 20%, and again, a net gain of approximately 35 Golden Eagle nests in our database. So again, we've captured these locations that are either new on the landscape or were not in the uh, initial rulemaking maps. Um, the others had more moderate changes. Uh, Peregrine falcons were up um, slightly, and prairie falcons decreased slightly. Ferruginous hawks, again, a small increase. I did highlight the northern goshawks. Um, it says 36% increase, it's only 550 acres. That is one species in particular that US Fish and Wildlife does not want to publish those nest locations. So we know where they are, our Forest Service knows where they are, um, but they are not included in this database per their request. However, US Forest Service is the surface owner. So in addition to CPW checking these, any, any service owner that requests we not publish their raptor data, they have that information. So when an operator goes to them to have their consultation and the surface use agreement discussions, that surface owner will be able to bring that information to the operator. So we do think that even those that are not published in this database, um, that information is going to be utilized to protect these birds um, during development. Um, I, so moving from, that concludes sort of our statewide updates. Um, and I wanna move now into the Southeast region updates specifically and um, the general information on Colorado Parks and Wildlife species activity mapping. This came up a lot in pre-hearing statements and we were asked to provide a little more context of how this works. Um, and so I wanna go through that first and then we'll go through the Southeast specific um, changes proposed for this year. The SAM mapping um, covers a broad range of habitats. It, and the, that information is used pretty much in all of our land use commenting, all of our federal planning processes, um, all of our cooperative efforts with our federal land managers. It is available to developers, counties, consultants in all sectors. Um, I lost count, but I know we update about 175 map layers every time we do these sessions, um, but there are over, like it says 700 and some actual files. Um, all of the definitions of these map layers are available on our website. You can look what the actual definition of elk production range is, elk, you know, winter range, all of that. Um, and then a subset of maps were utilized for the COGCC rulemaking and updated here. So again, from the statement of basis and purpose, the species included in our high priority habitat maps were those species and habitats that CPW is concerned about and for which CPW has spatial data and reliable information, peer reviewed published literature 
to make management recommendations for wildlife protection during oil and gas development. So we sand map everything, and then we take that subset of maps and um, propose them to be updated here. Um, the process, uh, for those that may not be familiar with how CPW is organized, we are organized into four regions. And then within each re region, it's further divided into areas. Um, the Southeast region has four areas in uh, Pueblo, Salida, Colorado Springs, and Lamar offices. Those areas are further divided into districts that may be a, a county, a portion of a county, a portion of two counties, um, and each has an assigned district wildlife manager. In addition to being a law enforcement officer, the district wildlife managers are wildlife professionals. They live and work in that district. They're trained and experienced in wildlife management and surveying and are responsible for knowing when and how and how many wildlife species are utilizing the resources in their district. Um, each area also has uh, terrestrial and aquatic biologists that are collecting data. We also have conservation species biologists in the regions um, that all contribute to that um, cumulative information. So during these SAM sessions, uh, GIS staff works with uh, an area office um, and works with these district wildlife managers, the area biologists and other local staff. Uh, definitions of each layer are reviewed as they work through each layer and make revisions as necessary. We have electronic whiteboards. Um, all of these maps are displayed um, on a big board in front of the room and everyone stands there and looks at them. And then they can overlay any data that we have. So we have data from, we can overlay aerial photographs and see where development has taken place over the last year since we, we did this. We can look at aerial survey data. We can put, there are points on the map that will show everywhere um, a big game or something was counted on the landscape. We can look at um, collar data if we have it. We can look at previously entered ground observations. Um, we also have research data available either from CPW and some submitted from organizations. We do have reciprocal data agreements with our um, scientific collecting permits. I think most of the data we receive is really on the aquatic side with um, researchers and consultants, but um, they do provide that information back to CPW. We get bat data that way as well. We do get some raptor nest data um, through those reciprocal data agreements. And again, these may cover really small areas and they may not inform these larger management decisions, but we have access to it all in one place to look at while we are reviewing these maps. Um, so we also have, um, again, a lot of these um, don't change when we do these remapping, but what is important to understand is that years of information are, are captured in these maps. Again, ground observations, information shared by wildlife watchers, by landowners, by hunters, by our annual flight surveys. Um, again, collar and research data if we have it, habitat and vegetation, fire on the landscape. All of this is summarized with the professional knowledge of our district wildlife managers, our area wildlife managers, and local biologists and GIS staff. This is really decades of observations and collective professional expertise. Um, cumulative information that summarizes wildlife use of the landscape. Um, and like I said, this data is also far less dynamic than um, we saw with the previous layers discussed today. We do see changes, but you know, um, they tend to be more shifts in habitat use um, and expansion into new habitats. The SAM data is publicly available from CPW GIS links. This is the, the, the maps page. You literally just go on the CPW page and search maps and this comes up. We have a library with ArcGIS that has all of the layers that are publicly available as well as versions in Google Earth. There are also maps of all of our area offices and contact information. If you have questions or information to share with CPW staff, all of that contact information is also available um, there. Um, and with that, I will go really briefly through um, what was proposed from our SAM updates. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, updates are completed in one region per year. This map uh, shows the four CPW regions in the state. This year we were in the Southeast region. Um, Southeast region covers the plains, 
um, up north of I-70 over uh, through Werfano and Custer County, and then the Arkansas headwaters from Lake and Chafee County all the way to the Kansas state line. We were originally, the initial, the last map updates in the Southeast region were in 2016. Uh, we were scheduled for our SAM updates in 2020. Unfortunately, those were postponed due to COVID restrictions um, and were completed in the summer of 2021. Um, and although the Southeast region updates were included this year, um, that's not to say that other changes cannot be captured in other regions, um, particularly if research projects have information that changes sort of some of those underlying maps, those can be included. Um, large landscape changes, uh, such as, you know, fires on the landscape can kind of shift things more quickly than usual. Um, or again, translocations, things like that can be done in other regions. Um, they were not done this year though. So as mentioned earlier, the majority of sort of the added no surface occupancy acres were due to bighorn sheep in the Southeast region. Um, it's, may surprise you, but about 40% of the bighorn sheep in the state are in the Southeast region for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, and we had um, a few things kind of contribute to that uh, change in their production and both in their winter range and migration corridors. We had several large fires on the landscape, in particular the Spring Creek fire, which I think was 2018. Um, Sheep like sort of that post-fire habitat. Fire does remove trees from the landscape. It can improve sort of the vegetation that they prefer. And so we do see sheep move quickly into adjacent areas after a fire. We also had two trap and transplant um, operations and actually a third one since these maps were made um, that introduced uh, these sheep back into ranges where they had not been active and that would have changed the maps as well. And in that box, it shows a couple of those um, canyon herds um, that we have in addition to all of those along the Arkansas cor River Corridor, we have a fair number of canyon um, herds, including a very successful herd in the Purgatory Canyon area. That herd also um, showed had significant growth over the last five years, and that is also uh, responsible for some of those expanded red areas in that box. The um, species activity mapping also looks at um, the other big game species. And we did have some changes, and those are the boxes a little west of I-25, um, certainly down in the Werefno area and up in, again, um, near closer to the river corridor. The biggest acreage changes were for elk. We had some expansion of elk herds um, into areas they previously had not really been using for these winter concentration and severe winter areas. Um, after that, we had um, mule deer, severe winter range and winter concentration including areas down again in some of those canyons and Fisher's Peak State Park areas around there. Um, we have some additional mapped elk habitat. Migration corridors were mapped for all four of these um, ungulate species. However, the changes in acreage were much smaller than the changes that we saw for the winter range. And then lastly, um, the Changes were fairly minor. There were no changes in our bat hibernacula, which are listed under um, the rules. Bald eagle roosts overall, there was no change, but there were some shifts. We have a lot of roosts that are no longer being used, whereas some of our river corridor roosts um, grew in size. And then least turn and piping clover production areas. Piping clover is a federally listed species and least turn is a recently delisted species. These are fairly small areas, but they did have a 25% decrease in their um, nesting areas. And then lastly, um, I did wanna address migration habitats as this was mentioned again in several of the party statements. And as I mentioned under the big game updates, um, migration corridors were included in the 2020 rulemaking and updates to elk, pronghorn, mule deer, and bighorn sheep migration corridors were included in our SAM mapping updates. During the rulemaking, CPW biologists um, provided information on uh, migration habitats in Colorado and the importance of winter range to big game in Colorado and the descriptions of these known migratory movements and habitats. So where migration corridors were mapped in Colorado, maintaining permeability was the um, key focus of Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And they are listed under 1202D and covered in the rules under 1203. 
So migration pinch points were discussed as potentially included in future map updates. And I do wanna provide you with a brief update on where CBW is at with migration pinch points. Um, and then we also do have the, the chair of that working group available for questions afterwards. Um, we first started meeting uh, in December of 2020, less than a month after the rules were <laughs> approved by you um, to start these conversations. We, they, the group reviewed uh, what other states have done. They developed a working draft of the definition of what is a pinch point. Um, they reviewed caller data, they reviewed some existing modeled output, they actually, we, they built an initial attempt to build a model to identify pinch points from our existing data and solicited uh, examples of pinch points from our, our area biologists. And in the end, while there was general agreement on a proposed definition, the actual examples of potential pinch points have been fairly limited. And the attempts to model with the data as it was currently organized um, were did not really identify really distinct pinch points. Concurrently, their statewide efforts are expanded in 2021 um, that impacted and overlapped with this migration pinch point work um, and the mapping efforts. So efforts in part backed by um, the big game status report in 2020 and the big game policy report in 2021 that were issued to support the executive order. There was a new position added of a wildlife movement coordinator. Michelle Corden transitioned to that role in October of 2021. She's been very involved up to now. Now she gets to do it full time. Um, in addition, we've also had several new initiatives regarding mapping. So it's part of our wildly important goals um, to have new corridors mapped, to look at these map corridors. We have a BLM statewide RMP amendment around big game that will likely include migration. Um, we have this pinch point mapping exercise for the Senate Bill 181. There's a USGS um, effort going on to with Western states as well as you know, habitat connectivity and conservation plans. So in the end, with all of those um, mapping efforts, including mapping efforts by other Western states, um, all of these are aimed at a broader understanding of big game migration and corridor, corridors in Colorado. And CPW believes we will have a much better opportunity to identify potential pinch points supported by a much more robust data set that is coming out of these other statewide efforts. Um, so we are happy at a future date to come back with a much more detailed uh, update for the commission outside of this rulemaking. Again, they're not part of this rulemaking, but they, they are undergoing this, this mapping effort um, alongside that. And so we're, we're absolutely, we've offered to come back and before to do a longer detailed update on that, or we can answer some um, questions as well um, about this parallel process. And that is the end of my very little longer than I expected to go today uh, presentation. Um, and I'll pass this back to Mr. Duralno and Director Murphy. And again, we're happy to answer any questions you have um, after their final comments. Great, thank you. Mr. Garland? Yeah, thank you, Chair Robbins, and, and thank you, Dr. Voltura, for your presentation. Um, I'm just getting back to sharing my screen here and move that over there. Um, great, so the underlying purpose of COGCC regularly updating or regularly adopting, excuse me, CPW proposed map updates is to one, ensure that the commission data does not become outdated, and two, that CPW's maps and recommendations apply statewide to all consultations. Historically, as I mentioned earlier, COGCC adopted habitat maps in 2008 that were updated only once in 2013. And this left the COGCC relying on outdated information as well as CPW, COGCC staff, and the regulated community managing two or more sets of consultation maps and sensitive habitat areas lacking appropriate protective measures. In practice, the high priority habitat maps cover habitat areas listed in rule 1202C and 1202D, as well as a subset of habitat areas, as I mentioned, uh, not listed in either rule that trigger consultation under Rule 309E. 
<clears throat> the rules also include various on-ramps for consultation, on-ramps such as when a third party makes CPW, COGCC, or the operator aware of protected habitat type. This also covers habitat which a landowner may not want to disclose publicly on the maps, but does want to ensure protection of the resources, as, as Dr. Voltura mentioned. Um, Off-ramps, like when a, a nest tree has been blown down, um, also, also impact the consultation process. And additionally, we have found that because the aquatic species on the map buffers are based on the National Hydrographic uh, Dataset, or NHD, these frequently require field ver verification to determine whether a location is within the actual distance buffer to the ordinary high water mark. In such cases, it's important that the actual conditions on the ground carry the day. This uh, example uh, picture here, you can see that the blue streamline doesn't match the visual representation of the, of the waterway, and therefore the buffers, which are, are measured off of that blue map, are not actually accurate to the surface water on the ground. Depending on the habitat areas, operators know what operational best management practices are going to be expected of them when a proposed oil and gas development plan area includes high priority habitat. They address their operational practices in their wildlife protection plan, wildlife mitigation plan, or compensatory mitigation plan as applicable to their, to their application. During the consultation process, operators, CPW, COGCC, surface owners, and local governments can discuss best management practices, alternative locations, timing stipulations, and the presence or absence of the mapped habitat. The data contained in the high priority habitat map layers and included in this update are intended to ensure the reasonable and necessary regulation of the industry and ensure the protection of wildlife resources through the application of the mitigation hierarchy. COGCC first seeks to avoid impacts to habitat from oil and gas development through alternative location selection, consolidation, and other avoidance measures. If development without avoidance is not possible, then the oil and gas development plan permit process ensures that adverse impacts, whether direct or indirect, are minimized through operational and best management practices established during the consultation. And lastly, where there are unavoidable direct or indirect impacts, Rule 1203D provides for offsetting mitigation through compensatory fees or projects be provided to mitigate those direct or those impacts. And with that, I will now turn it over to Director Murphy um, to add additional context and information, and then um, we'll certainly be available for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Dronlo, and thank you, Ms. Fultura, for your expertise and guidance through this. I, I want to close out by addressing some of the comments that we've heard from a number of stakeholders regarding concern about the up-down vote, as is um, one of the issues proposed today. And I really want to clarify that it's staff's recommendation that these maps be either you know, approved or disapproved in their entirety without adjusting individual map lines. Um, I think Dr. Voltura did an excellent job walking through the scientific basis for updating these maps. Um, again, it's our goal to rely on the expertise of, of CPW in, in these arenas. And I, I think that, that um, the science is, is well established, recognizing we're gonna hear from a number of parties today who may have concerns or may also want to provide input into that process. And I think that folks can engage with CPW on that topic going forward. Um, I also kind of, the reason, another reason for the focus for me on approving or disapproving the maps in their entirety is the narrow nature of the rulemaking before us, right? We've already made the decision about how these specific habitats um, should be addressed through our rules. And now we're conforming them to what CPW understands is the on the ground situation. To me, it's a very different conversation than for example, we would be in if we're talking about what to do once migration corridors are appropriate for consideration in terms of how are they protected? Is it 1202C, is it 1202D? How, how do these pieces all work together? And I think that the other piece that's really critically important in my mind is the um, on-ramps and off-ramps that Mr. Duranlo has walked through, right? The maps are an important tool to understand the general expectations, but when we get down to actually permitting or looking at 
changes to a proposed oil and gas location or a new development, we're actually looking at the on the ground information. I think that those are really important contextual elements of why staff has recommended an up or down vote as compared to adjusting the, the guidelines. I think that there are other rulemakings in which we may consider wildlife provisions where, again, like we're having a, a broader policy conversation. But as I recall the discussion during the 2020 rulemaking and what, what is in the statement of basis and purpose, there's a, a big focus on making sure that COGCC's maps stay current with CPW's best best science and best recommendations so that we have our the state's wildlife expert providing similar guidance across the state to different industries and different land use de um, development proposals. Um, so I think that those, I just wanted to close out with kind of that big picture. Obviously, I'm, I'm not the scientist in the room on this topic at all, but why we think it's appropriate as a policy decision to either approve or disapprove the maps as proposed by CPW. And with that, Chair, I would um, close out my remarks that probably went a little bit too quickly um, and let us all maybe enjoy the, the elk pictures um, and staff and hopefully I can speak for CPW as well, are ready for questions or we can um, move on as is your direction, Chair. All right, thank you very much to all three of you for the presentation, uh, very good and helpful information. Uh, at this time, before we let you go, I'm gonna look around and see if folks have questions for the panel. Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you for everyone's presentation today. It was really, it was helpful for me, for me to understand the methodology and the data and how the maps come together. I, I just wanna confirm what I think I heard several times, which is um, COGCC is not the only one to use these maps for whatever purposes. And so if we were to make a special map for COGCC, what, um, how does that affect then how CPW uses its map for other, um, I guess, stakeholders that, that it works with on a regular basis. Dr. Vortura? Uh, yes, it, we would end up where we were under 1298 with separate maps, where we had data layers that were our 1298 layers. And we had our other, we've been maintaining these habitat maps, these high priority habitat maps since prior to, to 1298. And so we would end up having this divergence again, um, where, even though they're being updated, but they have different information. So we would still likely provide, I mean, although if, if people are giving us that information, we will update it with that information kind of through our own process. But yes, if you were initiating changes, it would recreate sort of two separate maps, which we've done before, but it is not ideal. And we think it's, it's more consistent to provide the same information to everybody. Thank you. And then um, I, I think what I, I think what I'm hearing, and I hope that I'm understanding this correctly also, is that every year CPW is doing this like across the state update and then focusing in on a rotating basis around to each of the regions where you're doing like a deeper dive. And are you looking at more species than the big picture? Yes, so our statewide, we do raptor nest surveys and lek surveys every year statewide um, on all of the species in the rules. So those do get updated every year. These SAM, up, SAM sessions are a deep dive. Like we said, there's probably you know a couple hundred data layers that we're looking at, things that are not even included in your rules. You know, ball, or, um, blue heron roosts, you know, sandhill cranes, bats, not just the hibernacula. So it is a much, much deeper dive GIS spends a week in each area. Every district wildlife manager gets at least half a day, if not longer, going through this. So it is a much deeper dive on much broader issues that are not just around um, energy. And so we do that once every four, it goes one region per year in the four regions and kind of counterclockwise around the state. Um, and we do think, you know, from looking at it, that those maps are less dynamic. There are less changes. There are lots of layers that don't change. Um, and there are some that do based on, on what happened in those four years. However, it is a, it's a much deeper dive and it is done again, one region uh, per year. Thank you. And then I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, um, I, I, uh, I'm trying to figure out in my mind, um, I think what some stakeholders submitted, which is where's my part in this process? Mm -hmm. And 
um, understanding that CPW does not work for COGCC, you're a sister agency, you have the expertise, you all are, are putting these maps together and we depend on that expertise that you, that you go through. I wonder if you have some thoughts about um, folks who are saying, I, I would like to be part of some formalized process as CPW is putting together their maps. And I, I, I hear you saying that there's an opportunity for people to submit individual observations that they see or research papers and that kind of gets folded in. It sounds to me like an ongoing basis with CPW, but is there any sort of formalized process on an annual basis, for example, where you all say to folks, if you have additional information that you'd like to share with us now is the time because we're updating our maps? No, we really do just take it as it comes. And I think it may come, if someone has a, a data set they want us to, you know, to, to use, they are welcome to give it to us, but we don't have a program to, you know, um, to solicit that because this information comes in continuously and we are continuously taking it. It's just that these GIS updates happen once every four years, but that is not the limit. We are constantly looking at those. Um, and it really is through some of the processes as described that um, that's the information because it has to be kind of vetted and taken in the big picture. You know, we have so much information, but you know, I, I can't imagine, I don't think any of us have ever said, oh no, don't give us your data. You know, if anybody has research partners, you know, um, anybody, we have a lot of other universities working in the state, any of that information is valuable, but it has to be taken into serving into context in the big picture. And so waiting until we're ready, by the time we get to these map sessions, we have all of that kind of going. And so it really isn't the time to do that. It really is if they have information, if they have concerns about a region, if they look at these maps and say, we don't think that's right, reach out to those area offices, reach out to the energy liaisons and start that conversation now. You know, don't wait for a map because the process really is more iterative than that. And I'm Thank you. Afraid. Yeah, that's helpful. I, I, think I'm, I think I'm trying to figure out that I think what folks are used to with the commission, right, is we're taking up a rulemaking we're going to have a hearing. There's an opportunity to give input and your your thoughts about um, what we're considering, and it's this is kind of a unique situation where we're depending on a process that you have, uh, you being the big you, not just you, um, and 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 us. And I think we as commissioners are trying to understand or figure out or ensuring that folks who want to be a part of a process feel like they have a. Um, a way to participate in a process. I think for me, that's what I'm, I'm trying to work through in my head. I, I think perhaps a, another point of discussion for us as we're deliberating is another point for us folks to participate is at, at a more granular level, which is when we're reviewing OGDPs, if they have information about a specific area, they could work with CPW's wildlife expert that, we cons that the operator would be consulting with, that the local government would be consulting with, to make sure that if something wasn't in the big map, um, that it got that attention as we're looking at individual locations, correct? Yes, and, and I can let COGCC kind of chime in as too, but you know, the public comment period, we had this discussion as well during the rulemaking in terms of when the public comment period happens and it happens fairly early in the process um, to allow for that, but also yes, they can reach out to, to us. Uh, we're on the, C, the COGCC map click on a location, it tells you who your CPW contact is. Greg, did you have something to add? <laughs> yeah, and Commissioner McGowan, I, I think that that is a good question. And, you know, we have had a robust public comment process in our Form 2As since 2008. I think we have really tried to make it as um, accessible as possible for the public to, to reach into our process and provide relevant public comments. And as, as Dr. Voltura mentioned, you know, our, our contact information for a given application is, is there on the website. So, so people can get in touch with us, get in touch with um, the regional energy liaison. Um, we know that people also work directly through division wildlife managers. And so we also do get feedback into our process, um, you know, from that side of it as well. Um, uh, you know, we, we think that is a really important process. Now, the downside is, is it kind of requires um, 
you know, somebody to be paying attention to, to what's going on around them, to the permitting processes uh, around them. They have to be interested enough to be paying, paying attention. Once an application is filed, there's some, you know, the, the timing of, of when their comments are, um, you know, are, are, are of when, when it's available for them to comment on, they, they do need to kind of follow the process. At the same time, if they have concerns, they can reach out um, you know, along the way and make sure that their concerns are voiced directly, like I said, to the regional energy liaison or to the COGCC staff. I would add to, um, you know, these maps are available here, the GIS data. If, if parties have specific concerns with these maps, now is the time to come to us. The good thing about having these administrative updates every year is that if we see something that someone brings us data and shows we missed something, we can catch it next year and we can manage it in the meantime. Um, the whole point of having these administrative updates was to keep this process moving forward and not have these kind of maps fall too far behind. And so I would suggest again, if anything that's been proposed in these maps, um, if people have feedback and questions, specific feedback to reach out to us so that we can address it in the next year. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rotera, for the answers to those questions. And, and thank you, Commissioner McGowan, for asking those questions. You know, I think, you know, all of us that have looked at all the party filings have sort of noted this echoed concern that folks want to have an ability to provide information. I, I think you're exactly right, Commissioner McGowan. They're used to our, the way we do things, which is, you know, during this week, we will have a hearing and we will take information. And what I'm hearing from Dr. Volterra is that uh, CPW is available at all times for the sharing of that information. And so I just, you know, want folks to hear that, um, that, you know, there, there is every opportunity 365 days a year to be able to have a mini rulemaking with CP, CPW in terms of providing them information so that they can ensure that their maps are indeed accurate. Um, I would note, and I appreciate the point that uh, from Mr. Duranello, um, that you know the maps are just sort of a screening tool, and you know for the OGDP, and you know once the you know there is a proposed location, we you know there's on-site analysis to ensure the you know avoidance, minimization, and mitigation as to wildlife. And I think that's an important point too. So those are just two points that I wanted to echo out to our larger audience as well. I did note that Commissioner Messner had his hand up, and so I'd recognize him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you all for the presentation. For me, that was um, super helpful. Um, but along those same lines, I did just have a question or more of a clarification, because I think this is an important point um, addressing some of the concerns I think we heard in the pre-hearing statements. But um, while I think it's understood that the high priority habitat maps are the primary uh, trigger to CPW consultation. Um, in 309E2D, there's a trigger that says CPW requests consultation or because consultation is necessary to avoid, minimize, or mitigate reasonably foreseeable direct, indirect, or cumulative adverse impacts to wildlife resources from an OGDP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, just a question for Ms. Voltura. Um, understanding that the maps are typically utilized um, to, to trigger a consultation, um, how does CPW, I mean, or would CPW utilize um, stakeholder information or public comment um, on an OGDP to potentially trigger a consultation? Um, on a, on a, on a site-specific OGDP that maybe isn't captured in the current maps? I think we could, absolutely. I think it would really depend. We do have to vet this third-party data, and we talked about that process, so that timeline, which is why it's important to have that information, because if someone comes to us, we have time to review that information, to review what they provide to us and say, yeah, we agree on that. Then when that OGDP comes up, we can be more quickly responsive to that. If someone is, is inputting information, and it's one thing if you can go out and see a bird on a nest, but if they are saying that it's big game habitat that we don't know about, most of those big game maps are based on years of data. 
it's like, where are they in the two worst years out of 10? That's a really hard decision to make on the, on the fly. So, which is why we encourage people to bring that to us sooner. But certainly we do. Um, we have, particularly there are some listed species in the Southeast region like Eastern black rail that we don't have maps for. So we have to do that. We have to look at every location and say, hmm, maybe that is, and then go back to our data. Um, but if someone came in and said, oh yeah, we have all of these photos of all of these birds there, then we might be able to at least trigger it to have that conversation. But the timeline is important because we do have to, depending on the type of data given to us, have time to vet and incorporate that into the bigger picture to do that. But it is it is an option. Sure, and, that's, that's, if I may follow up on that, the just, you know, again, that's a great emphasis of the importance of the on ramps, uh, you know, and off ramps to this consultation process. But it it was it was very deliberate, you know, that that the on ramps um, you know, make that, make the consultation process available to, you know, to COGCC to request it, CPW to request it, um, and, and to, to work, work it into the process that way. Uh, I appreciate those responses. Um, and, and I think another question that we heard about, um, that maybe gets addressed with this, uh, um, this option that CPW has to require consultation, um, you know, is any kind of data that CPW has developed between map makings, uh, whether that's around big gray migratory corridors or pinch points or stopovers or holdovers. And I mean, what, can it be anticipated that if there was data that has been developed over, over, you know, a period of time that perhaps isn't captured in that map making that that may, um, that may uh, have CPW look a little harder at a particular situation and determine whether or not consultation and application of that new information would be applied? Uh, absolutely. And again, when we were uh, developing these rules, that was pretty important because we have identified this lag in some of these really faster moving areas, or again, in areas, again, where new concerns are raised. So it, it is absolutely the intention that we will use our data in the interim. So these map go into, you know, go into effect. We already have four months of data. We'll have another map that we're reviewing those maps in real time as we go, um, as each permit comes up. And that is the intention of, of going forward. Great, I really appreciate that. And would love to take you up on the offer to go more into detail at some point about kind of the migratory corridors and the pinch points and holdovers and stopovers um, as that was a big, a big discussion point during the mission change rulemaking and still something I'm very interested in. So um, I would I would be interested in that. We can definitely schedule it. It is a fast moving uh, process right now where there's a lot of uh, interesting things happening. So we'd be happy to do that. Maybe we could, when you feel it's appropriate, get kind of an update to all of us at a you know work session or something. That would be great. Absolutely. Any further questions for the panel? I think we're all having internet issues. Welcome back, Commissioner McGowan. <laughs> um, we'll all do our best here. Um, seeing no further questions for the panel, um, I would encourage the panel uh, to stick around for the rest of the day as we hear testimony and evidence from our party stakeholders. Uh, we may want to have we may have questions for you three uh, at the end after we are, um, you know, starting into deliberations, et cetera. Um, and um, with that, uh, and I, um, what what we'll do, we have a short break scheduled um, now. Um, and so uh, we should likely come back at 1030. And at that point in time, we'll recognize our, our one public commenter and then we'll get into party presentations. So 10 minutes, folks. Give us just a sec, Ms. Christensen. Let's get the other commissioner on board.
I've spoken with you all so much, but it's hilarious. I get nervous every single time. <laughs> like, ah, come on. <laughs> All right, um, we have all four of the voting commissioners present. Um, I would just note for the record that um, we've got uh, Ms. Christensen live. Look forward to hearing from her in just a sec. We did receive some written comment uh, from Janice Brown and Liz Rose. Just wanna note that for the record. Um, and so with that, Ms. Christensen, uh, you have the floor. So don't be nervous, you don't bite. <laughs> it's a bad Zoom, I don't know, <laughs> I know. You can get me through Zoom. Um, uh, hi, uh, my name is Kate Christensen. Um, thanks for taking the time to hear my comments today. I'm the oil and gas campaign director for 350 Colorado. Uh, a little bit about 350. Uh, we're building the local grassroots movement to solve the climate crisis and transition to a sustainable future. We have tw about 20,000 members around the state of Colorado, and we want a livable planet so all species can survive and thrive. Sometimes I'm here just representing myself, but today um, I just wanted to be clear that there's about 20,000 people that I'm, I'm representing, even though I'm gonna start with a personal story. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, bald eagles arrived in the neighborhood where I live. I'm on the eastern edge of Boulder County, right kind of bordering on Weld. And I remember being outside and seeing three bald eagles like circling around above the houses. And I got my kids out. We're standing in the middle of the street, just like kind of, you know, like idiots. And other, other people are coming out, like, what you looking at? And like people riding by on their bikes. And suddenly there's like 20 of us just standing in the middle of the street like watching these bald eagles, it was magical. And they were they were circling for like 15 minutes. And we were pretty sure it was because we all, some of us, like I have chickens, my neighbors have chickens. We thought maybe they were looking for a snack. Um, no chickens got eaten that day, but we see a lot of raptors where I live, peregrine falcons and kestrels and red-tailed hawks. And sometimes there's an owl hooting at night. And that's one of the best parts about living in Colorado, right? Like hearing elk in rutting season and spotting coyotes everywhere or like pulling over to the side of the road on Highway 40 when you see other cars, like, what are they looking at? And there's a bull moose off the side, it's, it's magical. Um, that's just an example of how important this rulemaking is. It's important to get these maps right. The eagles, the sage grouse, the bighorn sheep, the elk, they're all species that are part of what makes living in Colorado great and special. So the COGCC and, CW, and CPW have a really important job. And the staff said during the presentation that the maps are what are driving this rulemaking and therefore they're what are protecting these species. But there has been a lack of transparency. And even though we are sure the process is thorough and dynamic, the evidence makes me nervous. Um, for example, in all these OGDPs that have been considered by the commission, many have had locations in high priority habitats, but CPW has refused to do formal consultations. They don't even always provide their informal letters of consultation to the commission. They also advocate for lesser impact exemptions and state the habitats to be disturbed. Well, they aren't prime habitats anyway. Also, the CPW redacted information from the core request that was issued by um, WBRC and others that and provided information only when those groups protested. Those actions don't inspire confidence in the agency or the process. This is further complicated by CPW's conflict of interest. They get money from oil and gas operators working in high priority habitats to perform mitigation when operators violate minimum restrictions. SB 19181's mandate was to first avoid, then minimize, then mitigate. And we have seen that oil and gas companies always turn to mitigation first when avoiding harm should obviously be the first priority and was legislative intent. Um, 350 Colorado supports the Audubon Colorado Council, Colorado Chapter of the Sierra Club, the Wildlife and Biological Resources Co Coalition, and the Front Range Nesting Bald Eagles, and calling for transparency for the ability to adjust maps, not just an up and down vote. We want a commitment from CPW to prioritize avoiding harm, not just mitigating. Oil and ga gas operator operators should not be telling CPW when information can be made available to the public. And this was detailed in the PHS by WBRC and others. Uh, we appreciate the work on, 
uh, migration mapping updates. I'm excited to hear more about that and the yearly updates to avoid stagnation of the maps. But if we're relying on CPW for these maps, we need to hold them to a higher standard. Talking about all these species makes me think about what it means to be human. There's sociologists that argue the moment we evolved into being human dates back to the first fossilized like leg bone that was mended. It started we started caring, it, we started being human when we started caring about those who are vulnerable. It takes extra energy and it takes extra courage and extra resources, but it is essential to our humanity. In this case, you have the power to regulate oil and gas and sage grouse and bighorn sheep obviously do not. But we know that oil and gas activities have a devastating impact on their habitats and the way to maintain our humanity here in this situation is to take protecting high priority habitats very seriously and selfishly to do everything we can to keep all these species alive and thriving so we preserve the colorado joys of seeing them spontaneously thanks for your time thanks kate does anybody have questions of miss christensen Seeing none, thank you for your time this morning and for the presentation. We do appreciate it. Uh, okay, <clears throat> we are gonna get into party presentations at this point in time. Um, most parties have been allocated five minutes. Um, however, um, there was some uh, giving of time to others. And so where it's not five minutes, I'll try to capture that. And I think that is the case for the first presenter, which is the Colorado Oil and Gas Association. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners, staff, parties, and members of the public. I'm Julia Ryan with Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek, appearing on behalf of the Colorado Oil and Gas Association for COGA and West Slope COGA. And I'm pleased to report that we will not be using all of our 10 minutes. So we would like to thank both CPW and COGCC staff for their efforts in this rulemaking. And I want to make just two brief remarks. First, we appreciate CPW's presentation this morning and it explaining in some detail the methodology behind CPW's updates. For example, CPW confirmed COCA's understanding that the habitat shown in the draft maps was field verified by appropriately trained uh, individuals before it became part of CPW's proposal. And on, the, <clears throat> and on that foundation, we support the draft maps. Like many other parties, we would like to see CPW's methodology in creating its maps be transparent, public, and part of the administrative record in a more upfront manner. It's important that we have a window into CPW's methodology because of the State Administrative Procedure Act or APA. The APA sets forth the process agencies must follow in conducting rulemakings. And particularly relevant to this point is a provision of the APA found in Colorado Revised Statute Section 24.4.103.4.A.5, which requires all information, including but not limited to the conclusions and underlying research data from any studies, reports, published papers and documents used by the agency in the development of a proposed rule. And the APA also specifies that the rules promulgated by the agency shall be based on the record, which shall consist of evidence, exhibits, and other matters presented or considered. And it goes on to enumerate a list of things. But the point is that we want a, a strong re record because that's what the rulemaking is based on at the end of the day. Here, the record was a little bit lean until today's presentation because we only had a, a partial understanding of the data and information CPW used in cre creating the maps. The January 18th stakeholder meeting was certainly very helpful and we thank CPW very much for it, but we also feel that this morning's presentation was great and very helpful and perhaps something like that a little bit earlier in the process would be something to consider moving forward. And again, COCA does support the maps and believes CPW sharing information as to how they arrived at the updates is not only good policy, but required as a matter of law under the APA. The second and final point speaks to all the confusion about whether the commission was simply voting up or down on the maps. And on this point, we wanted to note that there's a difference between the commission not having authority to mod modify the habitat maps 
and the commission exercising its authority to decide that it will defer to CPW's maps as CPW is the wildlife expert. We believe the commission does have the authority to modify the maps proposed by CPW, but we also believe it's appropriate for the commission to exercise its authority to decide that it wants to defer to CPW's expertise. And of course, in, in our view, this deference would be premised on there being nothing in the rulemaking's administrative record indicating concerns with CPW's methodology. And we understand Director Murphy's comments to support this position, that the commission does have the authority to do more than a yes or no vote, but that the commission recognizes there is a difference between could and should. And here it's appropriate for the COGCC, in our view, to defer to its sister agency and its many decades of expertise. With all that being said, Koga and West Slope Koga respectfully request the commission adopt the maps and statement of basis and purpose as proposed. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. So just to put a point on it, with the presentation and the information presented by CPW today, the APA concerns that you likely had in the past have now been satisfied? Yes, but just wanted to mention it because you know, we will be having these annual updates and it may be the case that future updates perhaps may have more controversy associated with them. And so wanted to have on the record the importance of having a, a strong record. But for today's purposes, we're comfortable with CPW's presentation and appreciate it very much. Okay, and we'll tuck that away for the next update in terms of process and how we ensure that uh, those issues are met uh, at a, the appropriate earlier date, perhaps. Thank you. Other Thank questions you. from commissioners to Ms. Ryan? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we now will hear from West Slope Boga. And actually, Mr. Chair, we're next going to hear up from Karis. Oh. Okay. I see that we have Ms. Hill with us. Yes, sorry, I if I missed an announcement, I was joining as a panelist. Um, so is West Slope Koga not going at this moment? That's what I've been told. I think you're out if you're if that's okay. okay. No problem. Um, good morning, commissioners and director Murphy. I'm Holly Hill, the regulatory manager at Keras. And I'm here today to basically just give a brief uh, summary of the process that Karis and CPW endeavor in wildlife mitigation. First and foremost, Karis supports the proposed revisions to the high priority habitat mapping layers and appreciates the updates from CPW and the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission um, that are going to occur annually as a result of the 2020 mission rule change. CPW fulfills a crucial role in assisting operators in determining the most suitable locations for oil and gas development in the state of Colorado. CARES and CPW um, have always worked together on wildlife mitigation protection plans. In fact, CARES and CPW began working together in 2009 to develop a wildlife matrix assessment to determine potential impacts of a project on wildlife. Keras and CPW developed this matrix as a prescriptive document to utilize at an infield onsite and during the pre-consultation phase of site selection and planning, as the matrix provides guidelines on assessing surface impacts for specific species by assigning each species a concern rating and a potential impact rating. These established species guidelines foster extensive discussions between CPW and Keras in developing best management practices. Once CARES and CPW have had a good grasp on the best management practices for a project that will be implemented, CARES will create a wildlife protection plan, or in some cases, a mitigation plan. 
These will be in line with the COGC's, COGCC's rules in the 1200 series. Most recently, Karis CPW and the White River Field Office BLM collaborated on the North Piance Wildlife Mitigation Plan, which became effective August 26 of 2021. This document established BMPs that Karis has agreed to implement to offset potential impacts of development to protect wildlife. This WNP established over 60 BMPs, operating requirements, timing stipulations, which means that Karis will be avoiding construction or drilling and completions during crucial, crucial habitat seasons, a description of Karis's mitigation commitments to offset unavoidable adverse impacts, and most importantly, a compensatory mitigation plan. The WMP will be presented to the commission as a part of a handful of upcoming oil and gas development plans Karis intends to submit in 2022. CPW's transparent objectives made the creation of this wildlife management plan a seamless process. And this wildlife management plan will be crucial to ensure that Karis maintains compliance with wildlife mitigation. Karis appreciates CPW's thorough application of wildlife boundaries and habitat protection BMPs and believes that this is the agency that is most able to determine what an operator can do to successfully offset um, any potential impacts. That concludes my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Questions? All right, seeing no questions, we wanna thank you for your time uh, today. Um, and now we will bring uh, Energy Council uh, up as our next panelist. Mr. Chair, you know, we have not heard from the Energy Council confirmation that they were presenting today. So if they are in the meeting and would raise their hand, we can bring them in. Okay, and then we can go to our next participant, Evergreen Natural Resources, if they desire to present to raise their hand or otherwise identify themselves. We'll bring Ms. Smith in on behalf of Ener uh, Evergreen right now. And again, if Energy Council is in the meeting and could raise their hand, we'll bring them in. Hello, can you guys see can we? We can. So you can like see my head, you know, not just my forehead. Um, I have a quick presentation. Is that okay if I share it? Yes. Thank you. All right. Can you guys see that? We sure can. Great. It's working smoothly so far. Um, all right. Uh, hello, you all again. My name is Mackenzie Smith. I am here on behalf of Evergreen Natural Resources. Thank you, Commission, staff, and public for the opportunity to talk to you all today. The high priority habitat rulemaking is something that Evergreen feels very passionate about. As you can see here, Evergreen operations surround the Spanish Peak State wildlife areas, while our neighboring operators operations surround the Bosque del Oso State Wildlife Area. Just three miles, or I guess within three miles of Evergreen's operations is also the North Lake state wildlife area. Los Angeles County has the most state wildlife area of any county in the state of Colorado, totaling nearly 58,000 acres within six state wildlife areas. Uh, within ever three miles of Evergreen's operations, there's over 37,000 acres of state wildlife area, which consumes 64% of Los Angeles County's SWA, state wildlife area. So stepping back from the micro picture that I've um, shared with you here, I would like to look at the macro of it. Um, this is a map of the entire purgatory watershed uh, and how this ties into the state 
wildlife areas in Colorado is at Colorado and downstream is extremely important. The purgatory watershed starts with the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, uh, which are in a white here, and flows east through Los Angeles County, Otero County, and Bent County, where it merges into the lower Arkansas watershed. From there, this water impacts 10 additional Colorado state wildlife areas, including the John Martin Reservoir, uh, which is only an additional 20 miles downstream. This watershed flows through Kansas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas until it finally meets the Mississippi River. Who knows how many additional states and federal wildlife areas this water impacts as it makes its journey to the Gulf of Mexico. Residents, businesses, and state and local agencies are battling severe to extreme droughts, wildfires, climate change, and increasing population with therefore increasing human demand all having to manage their farms, their ranches, cattle grazing and irrigation of their fields while facing increasing economic constraints due to inflation and regulation. So how does the purgatory watershed sustain this amount of, of state wildlife area? As indicated by the yellow dots on this map, Evergreen operates over 45 discharge points throughout the tributaries to the Purgatory River. These discharge points over the last 30 years um, are spread throughout the canyons of Los Angeles County and have created a habitat of growth, safety, and stability for wildlife and cattle, not only contributing, but creating an environment for wildlife to thrive in. This water does not cost the residents, the landowners, the local or state government anything. It is the most reliable source of clean, agriculturally safe, year-round water supply that the Purgatory Watershed and the state of Colorado has. This water has and will continue to play a major factor in Los Angeles County's ability to maintain, cultivate, and foster a home for wildlife. So CDPHE permitted pits are also a huge part of this. This map is from the state's website and it shows the permitted, active, and closed uh, and unknown pits within Los Angeles County. Currently, there's over 1,900 COGCC permitted active pits that have the potential to provide wildlife and livestock with options for water consumption throughout the basin. As you can see here in this picture, this is a deer drinking out of a stock tank, uh, you know, 12 to 20 feet off of the uh, well site. So what makes this water so important and how does it pertain to why we're here today, which is high priority habitat? The volume and quality of the produced water is what makes it so different. The quality of the water produced from ENR CBM wells is among the highest for any CBM project worldwide. So I'll break this down. In reference to 2021's reported water production volumes, Evergreen produced 25 million barrels of clean water, which equates to 1.1 gallon, billion gallons of water. Through extensive quality testing over the past 20 years, we've learned and verified that at least 85% of Evergreen's wells produce clean agricultural grade water that meets the 3,500 milligrams per liter TDS standard. This, meet, this equates to 935 million gallons of water produced per year. However, based off of our estimates from last year, uh, only 50% of our water was actually discharged to surface. So Evergreen ended up discharging 468 million gallons of water to surface. Here are some pictures of animals uh, living amongst our operations. Um, all of these are CDPAG or COGCC permitted uh, water facilities. So Evergreen's operations with the proposed high priority habitat map changes will now entirely be within CPW uh, high priority habitat areas. Our research along with CPW findings indicates that the clean water that Evergreen produces and discharges to surface helps to promote a positive impact on the wildlife and livestock in Los Angeles County. Provided that a healthy elk, full grown elk consumes four gallons of water per day in 2021, Evergreen provided enough water to sustain and support every head of elk in the state of Colorado uh, based off the 2018 population estimates. So as we near the end, um, Evergreen, Evergreen's produced water is creating, not only creating, but sustaining a uh, ecosystem of high priority habitat that is thriving. Without the surface discharge, these ecosystems would be negatively impacted. With constant year round discharge, we provide wildlife and livestock access to fresh year round water. So Evergreen's stance is this, we support the protection of the high priority habitat because without Evergreen's clean, agriculturally safe produced water discharged to surface, there would be substantially less habitat to protect. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith, for the presentation. Yes, thank you for standing by. Do we have any questions? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. If you wanna stop the screen share, we can move on to our next presenter. Thank you guys. The next few stakeholders may or may not be in the meeting and may or may not be planning on presenting. I'm gonna call on three or four of them and then let's see if anybody raises their hand. That is Fritzler Resources, Morning Gun Exploration, Small Operator Society, RPG Resources, Murfin Drilling Company. Again, raise your hand if you are any of the above and desire to speak. Fritzler Resources, Morning Gun Exploration, Small Operator Society, RPG Resources, Murfin Drilling Company. Ms. Larson, are you seeing any hand raising happening? I do not see anyone raising their hands, no. Okay, then let's move forward. Uh, TEP Rocky Mountain LLC. I do see that Mr. Jewell is in the meeting and perhaps he desires to present. Mr. Jewell is being brought, being brought in as a panelist now. Thank you, commissioners. Quite a catapult up, but we're ready. And good morning, Michael Jewell with Jewell Jimerson Natural Resources Law. On behalf of TEP Rocky Mountain, Terra Energy Partners, you know, I get used to these miniature bite-sized rule making, so I'll do my part to keep it snappy for this important work. So I got three quick points, probably two minutes here. Number one, Tara wants to be sure you are aware we're available at all times to discuss wildlife impact mitigation, especially on the technical end of updating and interpreting high priority habitat maps. As you know, a very massive portion of our acreage in the Piants is federal leasehold. Almost all, maybe approaching all, but please don't hold me to that, of our leases have stipulations and wildlife stipulations. Those stipulations include time year requirements that inform all of their planning, from minor impact maintenance to contracting and pur purchasing to heavier operations. So we believe this gives us unique perspective and expertise we'd love to share with you, CPW and BLM, as these exercises become routine and annual over the coming years. Number two, Tara believes we can continue to improve our lines communication and across agencies by the COGCC's leadership on the MOU updating process with BLM. This is ongoing, albeit with a small pause, but we know it'll get back in the swing of things as we kind of memorialize what efficiencies we have and where our jurisdictions overlap and where priorities should be given from one to the other. And this has a direct impact on HPH maps. So going hand in hand a little bit with the preference and the priority of CPW indeed, but because BLM is such an active partner where we are and we have so much data and information how we operate because of those dips, we think that's a great idea. And lastly, admittedly, most mundane, Tara would like to see if the commission could establish a schedule over the next few years where we have preliminary meetings with interested operator stakeholders, CPW, BLM, ahead of these rulemaking times, maybe get those times on the calendar for the next couple of years, just so that we have a promotion of a cadence and expectation of uh, tracking information and being ready so we can make the most um, of this process and protect one of Colorado's most cherished public assets. So thanks for your time and consideration. Best wishes for a quick and effective rulemaking and we'll be around should you have any questions. Thank you. Mr. Jewell, I have a question on that, that, that last point, um, scheduled sort of preliminary meetings with operators, CPW, BLM, CGCC, what, what are you, uh, thinking in terms of what that would uh, allow uh, for what what what's what would the goal there be yeah I, I was working on a few other items while Mr. Duranlo was speaking but I, I caught you know the bits of it there with the understanding that having a centralized I keep coming up the word preference but with the CPW's work being uh, preeminent we're just suggesting that maybe we have a time where all stakeholders including BLM could 
have the option to have a prominent role in that discussion before we go into noticing this rulemaking. So let's say this rulemaking were to be every February of the year, maybe September, October of the prior. We have that meeting before the holiday rush. So we all kind of know and we're armed with an understanding that everyone has contributed, you know, to get the best possible product. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will make sure that staff is when noodles over that suggestion um, because we are going to be doing these HPH rulemakings uh, on a yearly basis. So thank you for that. Uh, any further questions from Mr. Jewell? All right. You thank you, Mr. Again. Next, we have American Petroleum Institute. Good morning, Chair Robbins. Um, may I ask if you can hear me? Yes, we can, Mr. Martin. Great. Um, so good morning, Jim Martin, again, for American Petroleum Institute Colorado, or API Colorado, and good morning. Um, as always, we appreciate the opportunity to appear before you in this rulemaking. And as always, we appreciate the directors and the staff's hard work in this matter. The good news for a Wednesday and for a rulemaking is that uh, we have only brief comments to make. Um, at the outset, API Colorado wants to emphasize that they have no objection to the maps proposed by Colorado Parks and Wildlife or CPW in this specific proceeding. However, we want to raise a couple of process points. First, we were a little surprised by the agenda since it seemed to include time for a number of non-parties and for certainly for a large number of entities that never provided either pre-hearing statements or responsive statements. Now, it looks like many of them aren't going to appear today, but we believe that in the future and in any rulemaking, it's really important to require that those who show up at a rulemaking have provided pre-hearing statements, responsive statements, exhibits, witnesses, um, so that those of us who do provide those kinds of information and do participate fully in a rulemaking know what others are saying, what they're going to suggest, what kind of recommendations they're make, they were going to make rather, so that uh, all of us are treated fairly and there aren't any surprises. Second, um, we, we join with other parties in suggesting that the rulemaking for CPW maps would, ben would benefit from much greater transparency from the real party and in interest here, which is CPW. And I want to pause for a moment and disassociate ourselves entirely with the comments you heard today from CPW, or rather from 350.org. Um, we, we don't subscribe to those sentiments. We are simply urging that the commission provide much greater transparency into the process that we're participating today, in, in which we're participating today, in which we expect to continue year over year as these maps are, are maintained. While this proceeding was pretty non-controversial so far as we can tell, that lack of transparency and the lack of rulemaking safeguards wasn't fatal, isn't going to be fatal, but it could be in the future. Annual adoption of, of these maps should not be a black box exercise. In our view, while the commission has the authority to adjust habitat maps, there may be less intrusive <clears throat> and less time consuming ways to ensure that maps and their supporting documentation are properly vetted. There's probably several ways to address this issue. The one we're suggesting, the least, pro least process oriented, would be to ask CPW to initiate a full stakeholder process well in advance of future rule map rulemakings to share all of their data and their documentation and their methodology, and to accept and respond to comments. We also recommend that maps be field, ver field verified, and we're, we were pleased to hear this morning that that's in fact what, the, what CPW is doing. But in these ways, stakeholders could ensure their concerns have been heard and perhaps even addressed. In such a situation, it may be appropriate for the commission to defer more to CPW and to engage in a less searching inquiry but that places the burden where it should rest, which is with CPW. With that commissioner or Chair Robbins and commissioners, that concludes my remarks and happy to take any questions if you have any. 
Okay. Um, so a, a couple of comments, I think, um, to the first remark, um, in terms of, and if, if I've got this right, and I'm going to ask Ms. Larson to, to help me, but we created a, a, a process that would allow people to be a party, but they didn't have to actually file written documents, and they were still allowed to testify. And I think part of that, and Ms. Larson helped me here, um, but a part of that was we anticipated this would be less controversial. And so, you know, didn't want to mandate the filing of pre-hearing statements just to get the qualification to then have five minutes. Uh, Ms. Larson, does that echo with how I think I read all that or the process? Yes, that, that is correct. Okay. So, you know, we tried this one on for size. Um, you know, we'll try to do this better. I appreciate the comment. I just wanted to provide, you know, at least my perspective on how it is we got to where we are. So I don't, do you have anything in response to that, Mr. Martin? I assume that was your intention, um, Chair Robbins, and I understand it. But um, on the other hand, we looked at that list and I have to say, we have no idea whether some of these parties will appear and even no, no idea what it is they're going to say to you. And so no opportunity to respond. To you. Okay, fair enough, that, that's, a, that's fair. So um, let me take those comments and ensure that uh, the next iteration of the process is, uh, is a better one as we continue to try, try for process improvement. Um, I, I take your second point, you know, I, I guess I agree with your second point about the, um, you know, suggestion to our sister agency about doing a fuller stakeholder process, um, sharing data methodology, et cetera. You know, that's just a nudge that we can make. Obviously, they're their own entity and they do what they will do. I, for one, um, you know, and I haven't voiced this issue yet, but I, I mean, I tend to agree that we, COGCC, have authority to possibly not just take the maps and up or down vote them. I also think we have the discretion, if we think that they're okay, to do an up or down vote. And uh, I'm waiting until the end of the day or the end of the hearing to determine what is appropriate um, you know, for this round as well as the next round as well as the next round. So um, again, nudge taken um, to suggest to our sister agency, and uh, you know, I, th I think we're all working on working a you know as transparent a process as is able with the notion that at sometimes transparency is not the best point. You know, we noted some of the wildlife folks or some of the landowners didn't want there to be that information that's publicly facing. So I think there's a bit of a balance there. But I am no wildlife scientist, so I'm going to stop harping here, and I'll look to see if. My fellow commissioners have better questions for you. Oof, that's rough. They don't have better questions. <laughs> Did you Your have question any was just fine, Commissioner German? Did you have any final comments based upon my rusings there, Mr. Martin? Uh, my, I guess my only final comment is that we elected not to raise issues of the APA and the adequacy of the record here, because as so, so far as we can tell, this is a relatively and perhaps absolutely non-controversial rulemaking. But um, we're at different, I think, that the CPW has failed to establish a record that would sustain your decision. Um, so that in the future, I strongly urge either the, this commission or the CPW to engage in a much fuller process with the public so that um, issues are fully vetted. And I think the burden should fall on CPW to do that. And if they fail, um, that should be, it should lead to a much fuller and more engaged rulemaking before this commission. Okay, and so you would echo the point raised by Ms. Ryan um, even though you've not raised it in this instance, but that that the point could exist in a future rulemaking. And so um, I'm looking over at our participant panel and I see some folks from CPW that are listening in. So um, I think you're probably being heard and, and we'll work with, uh, you know, we'll let that agency make sure that they 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 hear the points that are being raised. Commissioner McGowan, did you want to, do you have a 
follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Martin, for your for your comments today. I think what I'm so in the past, what was the process to give input into CPW's maps that the commission has used historically? Well, I think that Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner McGowan. Um, I think that uh, Mr. Duranlo is correct that after the initial adoption of CPW maps, the commission, for whatever reason, and I was on the commission for a while there, but I honestly don't remember, but that the map rulemakings that otherwise should have occurred annually mm -hmm. just didn't, um, perhaps because of the press of other business. So I don't know there was a process since there were no map rulemakings. Okay, so um, given that CPW is not, doesn't, isn't a part of COGCC, it's like a sister agency, I, um, I'm trying to figure out, we, we, don't, we don't get to tell them how to make their maps. And I'm not sure that we, we should be doing that because they have the expertise. And I'm not sure historically, and I, maybe I need to circle back around with CPW, that they've actually done a process that similar to what we do, um, that kind of um, honors what the APA is trying to get at, right? Which is, there's a, sorry. <laughs> um, Behind that door on the left. <laughs> yeah, the door on the left. Well, earlier the dog opened the door. That's why you didn't see anybody open the door. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what, what our authority is over a sister agency and its process that feeds into a COGCC rulemaking, what we want to put into our rules and a map that we use to help make decisions. And so I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that. No, I, Commissioner McGowan, I think that I agree with the chair that this commission has no authority over CPW, but this commission can set an expectation for a full and transport, transparent process for the development of maps and the sharing of data and other information. And that if CPW conducts that uh, exercise all the better because they are the agency with expertise. If CPW, CPW doesn't, and in the future, if you are faced with a much more controversial set of issues, that this agency, the commission, would have to engage in that more search, searching and um, engaged process. Thank you. And I, I'm wondering if, um, similar to Ms. Ryan, that you thought the information that was provided today in CPW's presentation created um, more of that transparency that folks are looking for. Like Ms. Ryan and others who've uh, appeared for you before today, and I, I expect you'll hear the same from others who appear after me, it was an interesting and useful and helpful presentation on the last day of the rulemaking. Um, so it's interesting and helpful and um, inadequate. Okay, thanks. Anyone else with questions? All right, Mr. Martin, I believe you, we have exhausted questions for you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Chair Robbins, commissioners. Okay, uh, hearings manager Larson, um, there are a number of folks listed on the list, but I'm wondering if they're planning on testifying. So oh, next please. up, we we do have the Theodore Roosevelt um, uh, partnership and Ms. Suzanne O'Neill, the Colorado Wildlife Federation will be presenting. Good morning, Chair. Can you hear me? Good morning, Mr. Holtz. Yeah, I, I'm not Good Suzanne O'Neill, but she is here as well. Okay. Do you need anybody else to be raised to the panel? I see uh, Ms. Yeah. O'Neill is on the panel. I think just Suzanne and I are adequate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, members of the commission. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is John Holst. Uh, although you may know me from a different context, I am currently the Senior Wildlife and Energy Advisor for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, or TRCP, as we're more commonly known. 
TRCP's mission is to guarantee all Americans quality places to hunt and fish. I'm here today with Suzanne O'Neill, uh, the Executive Director for the Colorado Wildlife Federation. Suzanne and I are presenting on behalf of the wildlife hunting and angling groups who filed a pre-hearing statement. Those groups collectively include uh, Colorado Wildlife Federation, the National Wildlife Federation, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, TRCP, Audubon of the Rockies, and the National Audubon Society. As stated in our pre-hearing statement, our groups are generally supportive of the Commission approving the High Priority Habitat Map updates as proposed for the rulemaking. We appreciate the, the, the thorough explanation of the map updates provided today by both COGCC and CPW staff. Uh, we thought that was very helpful. And like some of the other presenters here today, I think that probably would have been helpful a little bit earlier in the rulemaking. Since the appropriate level of inquiry uh, into CPW's high priority habitat maps seems to be of interest today uh, to a number of the parties to the rulemaking, I'd like to discuss that briefly with my comments today, and then I'll turn it over to Suzanne, uh, who will discuss the interest that the wildlife hunting and angling groups have in big game migration, uh, which was also talked a, bit, a little bit about today, um, and our interest in making sure that CPW moves forward with, the map, with mapping migratory habitats statewide so that they can be incorporated into your maps uh, next year. Regarding uh, the appropriate level of inquiry by the Commission into CPW's high priority habitat maps, a coalition of supporting organizations submitted a public comment on Monday that I think outlines pretty well what we feel the appropriate level of inquiry should be. Uh, it's, it's not a long letter, but I'd like to read that comment into the record today. It states, uh, dear chairman and commissioners, we the undersigned organizations collectively represent tens of thousands of Colorado hunters, anglers, outdoor enthusiasts, and other conservationists who have a deep connection to Colorado's wild landscapes and wildlife. We write to express our support for updating the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission's wildlife maps based on the input provided by Colorado Parks and Wildlife on its high priority habitat maps. While not formally a party to the current map update rulemaking, we raise our collective voice to express support for keeping CPW's high priority habitat and other species activity maps apolitical, based solely on input from the agency's professional biologists and staff. One of the primary tenets of the North American model of wildlife conservation is science-based wildlife policy. To accomplish this, CPW collects data from a variety of sources, including their own inventory efforts and peer-reviewed scientific research conducted by partner organizations and academic institutions. We trust CPW's expert opinion and the ability of its staff of professional wildlife researchers and scientists to objectively distinguish between reliable data worthy of mapping for public distribution and unreliable data that may be generated or distributed by an outside party to advance a particular interest. Incorporating a stakeholder-driven working group or other stakeholder process into CPW's independent data review and map making process threatens turning what should be a purely biological, science-based process into a political one. We value transparency in government and data when it does not cause unintended harm. With that in mind, we do support COGCC soliciting and responding to public feedback on CPW's high priority habitat map layers during its annual map update rulemaking. It is entirely appropriate for COGCC to annually evaluate its own statutory obligation to avoid, minimize, and mitigate harm to wildlife resources. And whether adopting CPW's updated high priority habitat maps is the best means to meet this obligation. We do not, however, support a separate stakeholder driven process designed to influence the boundaries of CPW's independently created high priority habitat map layers. Hunting and fishing and watchable wildlife contribute 5 billion in economic output to Colorado each year and support 40,000 jobs across the state. Our organizations want to protect the integrity of CPW's independent data review and habitat mapping that supports their wildlife management efforts and the efforts of countless other partner agencies, organizations, and private landowners to manage wildlife habitats across the state. And then the letter is signed by uh, a number of sporting organizations. Uh, as of the hearing today, we have 12. It includes TRCP, Colorado Wildlife Federation, 
Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, the National Wildlife Federation, Coloradoans for Responsible Wildlife Management, Colorado Trappers and Predator Hunters Association, Keep Route Wild, the National Wildlife Tur Turkey Federation, uh, Colorado Chapter, Safari Club International, the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Society, the Colorado Outfitters Association, and the Muley Fanatic Foundation. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to Suzanne to talk a little about the importance of mapping big game migrations. And then Suzanne and I will both be happy to answer any questions when she's done. Thank you, John. Um, can you hear me? I apologize for the video, but it's very windy here and my transmission is on and off. We can can hear you hear me? Fine. Yes. Okay. And I apologize for that. Um, so good morning, um, Mr. Chair and commissioners. As stated by Mr. Duranlo and Dr. Voltura, the updated maps for big game migration are um, in the updated rulemaking only for the Southeast region. And the updates do not include pinch, po pinch points that, as the work was not completed, but remains in process. Our groups to the pre-hearing statement, the wildlife hunting and angling groups that we referred to as WHAG in our filing, addressed migration corridors, recognizing that unmapped corridors in the Northwest, Southwest and Northeast regions are not squarely before you in this rulemaking. Our purpose simply is to underscore the need to complete the mapping for migration corridors for the remaining regions and the pinch points as soon as practicable. Um, we appreciate that Dr. Voltura confirmed this morning what was stated at the stakeholders meeting January 18th that the internal CPW working group is working on pinch points and we, are, we appreciate it's a fast moving process and also are pleased that the commission expressed interest today in discussing progress and status with CPW as soon as practicable. We believe that it's important that updated maps of migration corridors statewide be presented for the update rulemaking in 2023 to enable full application of 1202D 1 through 4. We recognize that CPW has an extraordinarily heavy workload, but we think this expectation is reasonable because there are other processes that will be going on this year. For example, the BLM process to develop a statewide resource management plan amendment will be going, will be beginning this year probably this summer. And obviously migration corridors are a key element in that process. They will issue a notice of intent, intent followed by scoping. Many of us will of course participate in scoping. So it's logical to us that mapping for the entire state will likely be completed this year for this BLM process well before your 2023 mapping update rulemaking. In our view, it's simply not ideal to have a void or a significant timing gap between the maps used in the BLM process and the USGS process this year and those in effect for the COGCC rules for purposes of, of avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating impacts to wildlife and their migration corridors. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay, uh, thank you to the panel. Um, Mr. Holst, I'm gonna drill a little deeper with you. Um, you know, we've heard, I assume you listened into API and COGA and sort of the, <clears throat> notion that uh, absent the information that was presented this morning, perhaps the record was a little lean. Um, and then you raised the issue from, and I think it's a good one, from a scientific perspective that the science needs to rule and we don't need to have sort of political theater around a rulemaking. Where's the balance? So thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I, I guess, um, I disagree a little bit with uh, Mr. Martin's uh, assertion that the, the sort of need to sort of take into to, to account stakeholder input should occur with CPW. I don't think that's the case at all. 
Uh, I do agree with the COGA presentation that the commission here has authority um, essentially to, to do what they want with um, habitat maps for the purposes of uh, achieving, you know, their obligations under the under the act. Um, having said that, you know, the commission has chosen to adopt CPW's maps because they see CPW as the best source of information. Um, and in this case, I agree. I think I think they are. Um, but that that doesn't necessarily, um, in my opinion, negate the need for this commission to at least take, uh, you know, a little bit of a hard look before they adopt CPW's map updates. Um, and that's a, that's where I think I guess that that balance rests is I do think the commission here should, you know, ha have a little bit of an evaluation on its own before they just update the maps and, and do an up or down vote each year. Um, I think like like a lot of the other presenters this this year's um, maps are pretty uncontroversial and so that you know look doesn't necessarily need to be very deep but any in a year where um, it might be more controversial I could see there needing to be a harder look uh, at some of the updates okay thanks I just wanted to give you a, a second shot at uh, identifying from the different groups that you represent um, the preferred solution. So I appreciate that. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you both for the um, presentation and the discussion here today. Um, I had a question uh, for Mr. Hulse along the similar lines as Chairman Robbins, but um, you know, I think Dr. Voltura indicated today that um, CPW does take input from stakeholders on a rolling basis throughout the year. Um, and then that input is independently verified by CPW in, and, and potentially has the ability to influence um, high priority habitat mapping. Um, do you feel like that's the appropriate and adequate mechanism and methodology for uh, providing stakeholder input into the CPW maps um, rather than a formal CPW stakeholder or rulemaking type process? Thank you, Commissioner Messner. I do. I think that you know the way CPW approaches its its mapping right now works pretty well, and I, I think you know we'd be hard pressed to find um, a better data set, sort of statewide, for all the species that they have data for. Um, so I think that process works well for them. That's not to say um, that again, you know, as part of a need to satisfy APA this commission maybe shouldn't take some public input before it adopts those maps next year. I think for CPW's purposes, trying to keep the maps apolitical, you know, taking their time, essentially evaluating uh, sort of the, the reliable nature of data or not before they make updates to their maps that they publicly distribute, not just to COGCC, but as uh, I think uh, Commissioner McGowan touched on earlier, I mean, CPW's maps are used by all sorts of, of uh, you know, local municipalities, the federal agencies across the state. And so there's a real, um, I think, advantage to having those map layers be consistent and those definitions be consistent across jurisdictions across the state. Um, having said that, you know, clearly folks do want to be able to feel like they are party to, um, I guess, this rulemaking as you guys update your maps each year. And so maybe uh, it would behoove this commission to solicit some public feedback or at least look for opportunities for for public input uh, a little earlier in the rulemaking process next year no, i appreciate that i mean it, it appears that i mean i think it's interesting the 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 thought of you know the need to meet the apa standards uh, but perhaps having the ability to do that both by documentation by cpw on the rolling um data that they're being provided by stakeholders and uh and independently as an agency in determining what um what is being utilized in those high priority high priority habitat map adjustments as well as uh cogcc having a uh a, a rulemaking process that would allow for um additional information in my mind would probably meet that apa standard so um, thank you for that. I think it was a good perspective to bring to this rulemaking um, and also appreciate you bringing up the um, migratory corridors and 
uh, the information around those, um, which is important to this commissioner. So thank you. Other questions? All right, seeing no further questions. Uh, thank you again, uh, Ms. O'Neill and Mr. Holtz. We do appreciate your presentation. Thank you all. We now we'll turn to Colorado Sierra Club. Uh, good morning, commissioners, and thank you so much. I appreciate your time and your consideration. Uh, the Colorado Habitat Stewardship Act instructs the commission to minimize adverse impacts to wildlife resources affected by oil and gas operation. This suggests that the commission has broad statutory authority and even a duty to protect and avoid and minimize adverse impacts to wildlife. The, dish, the definition of high priority habitat states that, quote, the extent of these high priority habitat areas is subject to update on a periodic, but no more frequent than annual basis and will be modified only through the commission's rule ranking process described in rule 529, end quote. This would suggest that it's up to the commission through its rulemaking process to quote, modify and determine the extent of high priority habitats Therefore, the commission's contention that it's limited to accepting or rejecting the totality of CPW's high priority habitat maps is inconsistent with the very definition of high priority habitat. We dispute the conclusion that the commission may only add or refuse to add CPW's high priority habitat maps to the commission rules and therefore that the commission will not accept any testimony from the parties. The commission has acknowledged that to carry out its legal duties, including to protect big game winter range and migration corridors, it must play a significant role along with CPW to update the high priority habitat maps accordingly. Colorado Sierra Club asks that the commission recognize it has the authority and duty to consider amend to amending the HPH maps and that the scope of the commission's evaluation of the HPH maps, including one, to allow parties to present factual science-based information to the commission, and second, consideration of whether CPW has neglected to, to consider relevant data and include various habitat maps. Such considerations would improve the mapping of high priority habitats in Colorado to re reflect up-to-date factual analysis of at-risk wildlife and plant resources to enable their conservation. In our scientific opinion, current HPH maps neither protect Colorado's biological resources that are threatened by oil and gas development, nor do they provide sufficient information for it to protect biodiversity as required by Colorado law. Decades of research documents that the primary causes of, for instance, sage grouse habitat loss are anthropogenic disturbances, most notably non-renewable energy development conversion of sagebrush to agricultural crops and so on. But high priority maps as provided by CPW do not recognize or protect all species of concern as listed by the State Wildlife Action Plan or the list of species in the COGCC rules. Neither do they provide adequate buffers or measures to conserve those species. For instance, numerous raptor species that are included on the spot on the swap and that have nest sites as documented by, for instance, several Audubon groups are not included in CPW's mapping. Additionally, greater sage grouse lek buffers recommended by CPW are not in accordance with high quality and accurate scientific information. Protection of greater and Gunnison sage grouse also protects greater than 350 native wildlife species that rely on a healthy sagebrush biome which depends on protecting and improving sagebrush habitat. Without a healthy sage habitat, sage grouse and associated species are unlikely to survive for the long-term. Current HPH maps are inadequate to protect Colorado wildlife and biological resources. Many science and conservation organizations have expert 
scientific information regarding the location and needs of Colorado's natural heritage, including the needs of organisms to successfully survive our warming climate. Much of this evidentiary information is, is absent in the HBH maps provided by CPW. Keeping common species common will prevent the need for Endangered Species Act listing and all that that implies. In consideration of preserving our natural heritage, the Colorado Sierra Club asks the commission to reverse its order, restricting this rulemaking to a decision to whether to approve or deny adding CPW's maps to the commission rules, and instead allow members of the public to present factual science-based information to the commission, and also consideration of whether CPW has neglected to include various habitats in its high priority habitat maps. Thank you so much. I appreciate your concern, your consideration uh, for this very important, very important process. Questions? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Malone for presenting here today on behalf of the Sierra Club. Um, I wonder if you had the opportunity to uh, listen to the presentation that was giving, uh, given earlier in the rulemaking uh, from CPW and COGCC regarding the issue of authority and the scope of this particular rulemaking. Uh, yes. And I think it was clearly indicated that um, that the authority um, by the COGCC to determine information in this rulemaking wasn't limited to the high priority habitat maps that were presented by CPW, but was a, a determination of whether or not we felt like the high priority habitat maps were adequate in, um, in meeting the needs to protect public health, safety, welfare, wildlife, and environmental resources utilizing those high priority habitat maps? I don't, I wasn't clear on that. Okay. Um, so that was the understanding that I was, um, that I had regarding this particular rulemaking. And so I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, we are making a determination whether the high priority habitat maps presented by CPW are adequate whether there's additional information that may be necessary. So um, I thought I would just make that comment and ask a couple of questions about that because I thought maybe you had missed that. No, I didn't miss it. And I, I uh, hopefully I was somewhat clear. And if not, I apologize that I think that the mapping provided is not adequate and that additional mapping uh, provided by expert science-based um, experts in specific fields uh, should be included in the, the process and in the matter. So one of the topics that came up today was the uh, presentation from Dr. Voltura that indicated that CPW takes um, input from a number of different resources on a rolling basis. Um, have you ever provided input to CPW on any of these high priority, high priority habitat areas? Through, C through uh, various organizations, yes. Okay. And do you feel like those um, comments were taken into consideration in determining what ultimately is determined to be high priority habitat? Not adequately. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, seeing no further questions, thank you very much for the presentation and for the participation with us. Uh, at this time, I believe the next speaker um, will be Yora Walker with Western Resource Advocates.
Good morning. Good to see you again. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm going to share my screen in theory. Oh my gosh. Okay, thank you, Joral Walker for Western Resource Advocates. I'm gonna focus my presentation on the commission's decision that it doesn't have jurisdiction over, or I'm sorry, that it doesn't have authority to amend the CPW high priority habitat maps and to limit the scope of this hearing to an up and down vote on whether to adopt those maps. And so the refusal to consider either pre-file or witness testimony. The consequences of this um, limitation on the scope of this rulemaking is significant. Uh, the commission has restricted its ability to carry out its statutory and regulatory obligations. And to suggest that the public reach out to CPW to provide data that would influence the maps is not the same as allowing the public to present facts and analysis to the commission, which has a different expertise and a mandate than CPW. There's also a lack of accountability or ways for the public to hold the commission responsible for the commission's own statutory and regulatory obligations. And these include, as we show below and which are acknowledged by the commission, that it has a role in ensuring the CPW maps are based on the right data, are modified correctly, reflect the current extent of high priority habitat and carry out the dictates of the 2019 EO entitled Big Game winter range and migration corridors. There's also little transparency and little for, uh, no formal process to influence how the high, pri high priority habitat maps were developed. CPW acknowledges that it takes data uh, as it comes in and has no process for public notice and comment. There's no formal process to influence the details of the high priority habitat maps, including what factors, analysis, and the data the commission versus CPW should consider. The commission acknowledges it has a role specific to high priority habitat maps to consider and finalize the details of those maps. And asking the public to focus on site-specific decisions is not the same as allowing it an avenue to influence high priority habitat rulemaking, which requires for, uh, fewer resources and is more concrete and long lasting. So this is a slide showing the relief we requested in our um, pre-hearing statement. Um, so first, turning to this, this question of, um, computer is misbehaving, sorry, um, uh, of the, authority the commission has over high priority habitat maps. Um, this is an incredibly important point because the hearing order specifically says the commission does not have the authority. And this could have unforeseen impacts on what the commission can and cannot do relative to wildlife protection in the future. So first the Oil and Gas Conservation Act gives the commission broad jurisdiction over among other things, land and the authority to do whatever is necessary to carry out the act. Second, the mission change directive that you probably have memorized by now also gives the commission a unique um, obligation to protect and avoid and minimize impacts to wildlife and um, biological resources. <clears throat> These statutes give the commission jurisdiction to modify CPW high priority habitats. The Habitat uh, Stewardship Act also carefully directs the commission to consult with, but does not abdicate commission authority to minimize adverse impacts to wildlife, particularly when the commission is making decisions that impact wildlife, which is also a very broad notion. So the definition of wildlife, I mean, sorry, is a high priority habitat also gives the commission, um, keeps the commission involved in developing the details of high priority habitat maps. 
Um, while high priority habitat is identified by CPW and the maps provided by CPW, the extent of high priority habitat will be modified only through commission rulemaking, which is a formal process. Now I cite a series of quotes relative to high priority habitat from the commission itself that underscore the commission has a significant role in determining um, the details of high priority habitat maps. These are probably the most important quotes I have. Um, the, in interpreting high priority habitat, the commission particularly states its intention to coordinate with CPW to determine the current and relative data that it sh should provide, that should provide the basis for high priority habitat maps and confirms that the extent of high priority habitats will be updated through formal rulemaking process. Again, the commission here confirms that it will review and consider incorporating emerging habitat data provided by CPW as part of future habitat rulemaking. The commission also acknowledges its role in, in implementing the 2019 EO. Um, sorry, I'm getting out of order here. Um, specifically in the context of high priority habitat. And these acknowledge and confirm that the commission has a role versus vis-a-vis uh, -vis the details of high priority habitats. So finally, the commission does have jurisdiction and the duty to delve into the details of CPW maps, including to ensure those maps are based on the right data, reflect the correct extent of high priority habitat, and carry out the dictates of the 2019 executive order. Put another way, the public must have a role to, or an avenue to influence the commission when it undertakes these factual and policy considerations. The commission has acknowledged that it has its own set of authorities and obligations and must provide the public the opportunity to weigh in on the exercise of that authority and compliance with those duties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for presenting to us. Uh, do commissioners have questions? Commissioner Messer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Walker, for presenting. Um, you know, I do appreciate that you bring up uh, the consideration of commission authority, but I did have a question that's similar to what I asked the previous presenter, which is, um, I mean, you do under, do, do you believe that the commission also has the authority to determine that the high priority habitat maps provided by CPW are adequate to meet our obligations under the act? Yes, definitely. But, but the, I think the way I would sort of add a caveat to that answer is that remember that the hearing order specifically says that there can be no, um, pre-file or witness testimony. And so in a sense, although you're saying that the commission has the jurisdiction to um, you know, adopt those maps in whole and or reject them all together, uh, it's only appropriate, appropriate to do so after allowing the public to chime in on those issues. And um, because the commission has these different duties, different mandates and different expertise, what the commission would consider in carrying out those uh, that authority and that expertise is different than what CPW would do. Now, if you decide after considering your authority and your obligations uh, to vote up or down or delve into the details of high priority habitat or consider other considerations from the public, then yes, you certainly do. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, great. Thank you for being with us and for presenting. Thank you. Ms. Larson, who's next? Mr. Chair, we, we had Mr. Brad Lafane. Um, we will bring him in, uh, Western Biological Resource Coalition.
Hi, commissioners. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? We can. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Brad Clefane, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the Wildlife and Biological Resources Coalition. Um, I'm going to depart from the remarks I had typed up. Um, so I'm going to wing it, and that's always a dangerous situation with me, but I'll try and do the best I can. Um, uh, just one personal note, it's interesting that uh, back in the day, in the 1970s, I was a part of an effort called the National Coal Policy Project, which brought industry and environmentalists together to talk about uh, national coal leasing policy in the 1970s. And it was really interesting that after a year of spending it with uh, CEOs of some of the biggest coal companies in the country, that um, industry and we, the environmental community, were able to work out a process that we all could live with. Um, and I feel like that's kind of what's going on here, that the testimony of COGA, of API, and uh, Western Slope COGA, we tend not to agree with them very often, but um, we also feel that um, these maps should reflect the best science and best on the ground information to lead to the protection of wildlife from the adverse impacts of oil and gas development. Uh, but these maps should be considered publicly in a transparent form with adequate background information provided in advance to allow informed comment by all stakeholders, both public and industry. We feel that this has not been done here. Uh, one of the statements that um, is often attributed to President Reagan is we need to trust but verify. And I think that would be the point of a stakeholder process with CPW or with you. I think that CPW is probably the more appropriate agency uh, since it's their maps, but Certainly you have responsibilities as well. Uh, one thing that we need to understand or have a feel for from the process is all of the meetings that CPW has had. Um, uh, because they're not uh, revealed anywhere. And um, so we have no, no way of knowing uh, what the inputs of uh, the CPW have been. Uh, for, for example, we know thanks to the Garfield County website uh, that their county at least has been able to meet the CPW and get sage grouse maps changed according to their liking. Commissioner John Jankowski said of the maps, there was a big change between these maps and there was a lot of give and take in the process these meetings uh, occurred last fall. Um, I have asked the Garfield County Deputy Manager to explain what the changes were and how the public was involved, but I have not re received an answer. Um, it appears that the lot of give and take uh, occurred without public participation. How many of these types of meetings have affected the HPH maps and who is CPW met, met with? We don't know. In the absence of a formal rulemaking process revising those maps, these informal meetings feel a lot like de facto rulemaking from which the public has been excluded. Um, it is interesting that the uh, WRLG response, it's, it's some of the issues that we don't have answers to going into this rulemaking. Well, one of them has been raised by the WRLG response. Um, WRLG said, uh, these CPW maps have been adopted exactly as pre pre presented in this rulemaking by the Bureau of Land Management by way of categorical exclusion in 2019. That's a remarkable statement. Um, 
and I would like to have CEPW's response to it. Was that the 2019 process which was invalidated by a federal court case out of Idaho? Uh, the court said, quote, the BLM is enjoined from implementing the, the 2019 BLM sage grouse plan amendments for Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, Northeast California, and Oregon. Are the maps the WRLG is referring to, the, the maps which the court is enjoined, are those maps before the maps before us now? I don't know. We don't know. Six months ago, the BLM issued its five-year monitoring report on uh, the greater sage grouse. It found that, quote, in Colorado, the BLM had over 34,000 acres of surface disturbing authorizations within priority habitat since 2015, the most of any BLM state. It also found that, quote, the parachute peons roam biologically significant unit has reached the one facility per 640 acres density cap. Uh, this is information which we have not uh, had from uh, a CPW in this rulemaking or in any other forum. And it seems like it's the type of current scientific information which we need to hear. Um, um, sorry. Um, I would think it'd be useful, most useful for CPW to have to conduct these stakeholder meetings since we also need to open up the uh, CPW wildlife mitigation plan process as well, in our opinion, since these are plans which will be used to justify your approval for OGDPs. COGCC's cumulative impacts report said the CPW had completed two WMPs last year, but there was no public involvement in either of them. As a result, we, we got an interesting mitigation matrix in the Keras Piance plan, which was uh, mentioned earlier by Keras, which looks like it might have possibilities for, for being a useful tool uh, to assess future impacts in grouse ha habitat. But it only captures direct effects totally ignoring indirect and cumulative effects and triggers inadequate responses if the impacts appear too great. And in the Gondola North Park Wildlife Management Plan, CPW gave its tacit approval to an additional 130 well pads in that 99,000 acre area known for its sage grouse, likewise with no pub public input to the plan. So I think that I know that this isn't your issue, but a CPW, in our opinion, needs to find a way to allow public involvement much more than it currently has. Um, one thing is clear, uh, that mission change is not just a mandate for COGCC, that it needs to come to CPW as well. If, SB 181 is truly going to protect wildlife from the adverse effects of oil and gas. Stakeholders need to be brought together by COGCC and CPW to address these issues. The people of Colorado own its wildlife, not CPW. The old days of conducting wildlife assessments and writing wildlife plans in private, be that with operators or with the development favoring local governments must end. We need to bring transparency to the process. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> Do commissioners have questions? Very good, thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Um, we now have 
be the change? Well, it's still morning or just about to be new. Can you hear me, Chairman? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm Wes Wilson. I'll represent Be the Change today. Uh, we're a, a nonprofit dedicated to good government. And um, we appreciate the commission take the way it's managing the rules today. Uh, we're one of those parties who didn't su submit a pre-hearing statement. And I see my former boss, Jim Martin, he was boss at EPA when I was there, before he took that revolving door, um, doesn't want you to continue that. Um, and But I agree with the, the Ms. Larson's judgment here that this is non-controversial. What all the focus has been is whether or not CPW is running an adequately transparent process to develop their high priority maps. I wanna focus um, a bit on your responsibilities as they exist in the series 1200, since they've been updated under 181. With the commission's obligation to protect wildlife, I think we're missing some component parts, Chairman, the way you apply the series 1200. The definition of high priority habitat has that CPW has identified places with that should be avoided or minimized and mitigated. That means to be brought into your definitions, which I think it's adequately there in series 1200. You, you realize that the culture within the CPW is never to do avoidance or rarely so. Uh, they're faced with an, a completed plan and they go right to compensatory mitigation. The few exceptions might be avoiding these well-known lek areas, areas uh, for the sage grouse and, uh, and prairie chicken. But for a large majority of species, avoidance is not accomplished by CPW's consultation. That must be the commission's obligation. And we see that repeated in the way you manage indirect impacts. Look at the disastrous decision you had a couple of months ago of failing to protect a seasonal use related to a nearby bald eagle nest where the impact was not from the direct impact of the drilling, but from the indirect pumping of clean water into the site for fracking. As a result, Fewer bald eagles showed up at that location this year, this spring. So I don't think you understand properly how to implement your existing 1200 series. You have within it that the indirect impacts are also causing wildlife effects and should be avoided under your authority. That doesn't mean stopping at the pad line. It certainly would include the highways, the pipelines, the access to the location. And having been uh, quite experienced at EPA in implementing um, a, a, the wetlands program under the Clean Water Act 404, it takes a very rigorous process to do avoidance. In that process, it requires looking at the least damaging practical alternative to achieve that project objective. That can only be done by your authority. And I think that is your intent. I think that's your purpose under series 1200. So I encourage you and your attorneys to go back and look how you're interpreting 1200, both in your responsibility under 181 to actually conduct avoidance during the oil and gas development plan and your, your same responsibilities under 181 to avoid and minimize impacts from the indirect actions your permits cause. 
So uh, just to repeat, thank you, Chairman Robbins, for considering this different procedure here. We, we are one of those parties that didn't do a pre-hearing statement. So largely that's because parties are not setting this up for litigation. But do go back and consider how you're implementing the direct and indirect effects of your series 1200 rules. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, thank you for being with us and presenting today. Do we have any questions? All right, seeing none, uh, we've got three parties left this morning and then we'll take our lunch break. Um, first is Joanne Hackos. Okay, can you hear me at this point? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the purpose we know of the, I'm Joanne Hackus. I uh, am the conservation officer for Evergreen Audubon Society and uh, hope to speak to this issue of the high priority maps. Purpose of the high priority map rulemaking should be, I, we believe, to allow the public to review the proposed maps in detail, to learn the reasons behind the changes in high priority habitat being proposed, and to allow individuals and groups that have scientific expertise to share their information with COGCC. <clears throat> During the stakeholders room meetings, uh, the HPH rulemaking was promised to include opportunity for the public and experts to present new information on raptor nesting locations and other critical information on plants, insects, and wildlife adoption into the maps. We expected that to follow through. As advocates for wildlife and biological resources, we asked the COGC to allow public input to update and improve the mapping of high priority habitats in Colorado. We find that the current maps are inadequate to protect wildlife and biological resources that continue to be threatened by oil and gas development. Have you been hearing today? As you know, the activity required to open an oil and grass, gas drilling site and maintain it during the product production of oil and gas wreck profound disturbances on the surrounding environment. Disturbances of the soil and plants, truck traffic on surrounding access roads, presence of, presence of multiple workers disturbing surrounding areas, the noise, light, and air pollution all have great impact on the natural environment. The soil is disturbed so that little but undesirable weeds will grow. The noise and lake make it impossible for insects and birds to find food or produce young. The surrounding environment is disturbed far from the drilling site. The current HPH maps from CPW do not provide sufficient information to protect wildlife and bi biological resources as required by Colorado law. The maps are often limited because the information they contain is, is several years out of date. The maps do not include all the endangered and threatened species in the state wildlife action plan or the list of species in the COGCC's own rules. These are just simply left out. The current HPH maps should not be considered adequate to protect Colorado wildlife and biological resources as they now stand. Many environmental organizations throughout the state have come forward to offer invaluable information. They have been amassing for many years. We were so excited to be given the opportunity when we all spoke in January to be able to do that. 
This information on species is not included in the HPH maps today, and information that expands the coverage of the current maps and correcting deficiencies must be permitted. San Miguel County, for example, points out that historic leks for the Gunnison sage grouch are admitted from the maps. We know, as you've heard already, that Garfield County met with CPW to make changes in greater sage grouse range without input from the concerned public. We are concerned that CPW is willing to take confidential input from some organizations, but not from the scientific and environmental public representatives. As others have continued, we dis disagree with the COGCC assertion that it has no authority to change the HPA maps prepared by CPW. Under the new 2020 rules, the Commission has the responsibility to establish the HPH areas need based on the best available science and information provided by all Colorado organizations that are working to preserve wildlife and biological resources in the state. Rather than moving your, removing yourself from the decision-making impacting the designation of HPH, the COGCC has already acknowledged that it has a full-time job as a, in the implementation of HPH to do, safeguard all wildlife in Colorado. We ask that you open the mapping process and invite active participation by the scientific and environmental public in identifying areas of concern for wildlife and biological resources of all types and kinds and all over the state. Thank you very much for your time. Excuse me, thank you. Questions, commissioners? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Hackos, for being here today. I'm, I'm going to ask a similar question to Commissioner Mesner that he asked to a different participant, which was, have you all submitted some of the information that you feel is lacking through the CPW process? We've, we were accumulating, after the January meetings, we were accumulating map information, uh, data from a number of sources, um, we don't have we don't have a method of providing CPW with information. So thank you. Did you? I'm wondering if you heard or listened to the presentation from CPW this morning, which I think does indicate there is a process to feed into their mapping methodologies. Well, remember they only update the maps every once every four years. Right now, that mapping update is going on in Southeast Colorado. Um, I don't know of hearings that are being held. I don't know of innovation, invitations that have been extended. I mean, people like Dee Malone, who's a scientist with a huge background of information about species she studies directly in Colorado. She says, we don't get invited to these things. If they exist, we don't know about them. Where are they? Uh, thank you. So I. Um... Oops. I'm, I'm wondering if, 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 if we were to have some sort of process and um, an official hearing that feeds into how CPW has proposed this mapping, I might ask you the same question that I'm asking now, which is, did you connect with CPW and talk to them about what you feel is missing so that we're not in a hearing doing kind of he said, she said, that I'm going to, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that folks are trying to have conversations with CPW because that is this is their area of expertise before it comes to us as commissioners and we're making a decision about the adequacy of a map. That we, would def we would like to have a, a process with CPW where we could provide input. But remember that you have to be careful because CPW's maps don't include a high percentage of the species that are in the that are in your own rules. They don't include that. They say they're not responsible for those things. So what do we do with that information? Well, I think for to to some extent, 
um, the presentation given by Commissioner Nanjapa a couple of weeks ago has some ideas about how we could, might be able to deal with some of the additional species, but we haven't addressed that yet, obviously. And I'm not sure we'd be able to do that in one hearing adding to a map, right? So right. just trying to figure out where the balance is and how we might be able to work our way through this. Sure. Thanks. I thanks think we'd, we'd all be happy to to uh, to cooperate with CPW if we if we understood what what the methods were. Thank you. Others with questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much for being with Thanks us. Bye. All right. Um, do we have uh, WRLG in Garfield County up next? Yes, Mr. Chair, that is correct. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, get right to it. My name is Kirby Wynn, representing the Western and Rural Local Government Coalition of 23 governments. Appreciate the opportunity today. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, just right off the bat, uh, WLG absolutely supports the data and science-based regulations um, that are reasonable and necessary to protect the wildlife, the environment, public, and the economies of Western and rural Colorado. We believe what's proposed for this rulemaking fits that model by and large. Uh, specific to this rulemaking, again, we support the mapping that has been conducted, vetted, and or provided by Parks and Wildlife, while also asking the Commission to invite Parks and Wildlife, especially in future rulemakings and ahead of them, to provide much needed information regarding how the updated maps were compiled and quality assured. Um, we again, we support uh, CPW as the authority at the state for determining mapped boundaries for wildlife and wildlife habitat resources to the exclusion of any other party that might propose alternate mapping data or rules uh, during this rulemaking or future rulemakings. The, it's been laid out pretty well. If folks want to get involved in mapping of wildlife, they have all year long to engage CPW to do that at the rulemaking is not the place to say, oh, but wait, I saw something over here I want you to look at today. It's just, there's no way you could have the bandwidth to deal with that kind of input at this juncture. Again, as established uh, at the mission change rulemaking, the high priority habitats maps are to be updated annually through rulemaking. And we support this effort that we believe should ensure the latest science and data from CPW are utilized by COGCC, the regulated operators, and local governments to efficiently consider and process oil and gas location permits in a way that will provide due consideration for wildlife resource protections. Uh, for this rulemaking, again, we support the revisions as proposed, full stop. That's it, full stop. However, um, we have been rather shocked by a lot of the parties that seem to not quite understand. They're weighing in on a process they don't seem to understand. The maps are the maps. They're going to be utilized certainly to spawn the discussions about where we need to do site visits and further discussions to be had. Anytime there's a permit application, the CPW, the operator, the local governments have the opportunity, stakeholders have the opportunity to take a look and say, well, you know, it's not exactly map right, but sure enough, there's an eagle nest right over there. If it's not on these maps, there's still the opportunity for CPW to know about, find about, or be told by the operator or anyone else that there's sensitive resources and that can be considered in the sighting. So a lot of folks seem to think that if it's not on the map, that's just the end of the opportunity to protect wildlife and we don't think that's how it works. Um, however, uh, again, just provide a little additional color to our straightforward position of support for the mapping. We also see that CPW has not really provided uh, the needed information regarding data sources for the map updates. The, the CPW procedures for verifying the, the quality of third party collected data. We support third party collected data. It'd just be nice to uh, have it not be such a black box. And also we haven't really understood and been provided the procedures they use to verify, verifying the quality of that third party data and also the quality assurance, quality control procedures to ensure the proposed maps represent data of a known quality that meets specific data quality objectives. Surely there's gotta be some minimum data quality objective that these maps should meet. We haven't really uh, heard that. And again, we recommend that you uh, invite CPW to provide the missing mapping methods and quality assurance information, in particular at your next rulemaking. There's plenty of time to plan ahead. 
we suggest that the commission CPW uh, initiate a scoping process that includes some stakeholder input to outline documentation of methods that CPW should provide for the HPH maps next year. Not now, but next year. You don't need to continue this proceeding, but plan ahead for next year just to do better the next time, which is just a, certainly something we could do. To do otherwise, in our opinion, would be to continue on a track where high priority habitat maps are updated annually and no stakeholder, including this commission, has any way really to competently describe, understand, and comment on the specific quality of the maps. So we're just a little bit hamstrung this year, but I think you have an opportunity to have more information in hand next year and feel better about knowing what the quality is. Again, we wanna be clear, we don't particularly fault CPW at this time, not at all, for any failure to transparently provide detailed methods information. WLG believes CPW might really be in a bit of a untenable position at present, where they're required to produce and provide updated HPH maps annually. Uh, and perhaps that came by a combination of legislative and administrative direction that they have a stronger role, they have to specifically produce things and they have to take an existing process and they need to reorient it to meet this new need because it's different than what they were doing before in large part. And, and they really maybe don't have the adequate resources and time to do what we'd ask in terms of providing all this metadata and quality assurance information. And our concern is that with any data collection analysis and reporting process, when the time and resources are inadequate uh, uh, to produce, I don't mind, you have a, a drop dead deadline to hand over like these maps example. It's the quality assurance and the quality control procedures and the, really the documentation of that quality assurance and quality control that gets left behind. There's not enough time to, to dot the I's across the T's to document what you did, even though you have a strong process. So uh, with that, I think I'll just go back to uh, a restatement of just about sage grouse that's come up a little bit. We restate and emphasize our support for adoption without modification of the CPW provided greater sage grouse high priority habitat maps. And uh, in addition to being the last best available grouse mapping data from the state, we would remind that these CPW maps have been adopted exactly as presented for this rulemaking by the Bureau of Land Management by way of categorical exclusion in 2019 take strong issue against the couple of parties that want to assume that Garfield County somehow got in the back room somewhere with CPW and rewrote maps for Western Colorado, not the case. Um, we did have a, a key role we're proud of in putting forth the best available science and causing CPW, BLM and others to reach a consensus position on their priority and general greater stage grounds habitat mapping for Garfield County and other Northwest Colorado counties. That process was public it was well vetted, it was driven by science, and uh, we're just really proud that we were one of the entities that initially raised up the, asked CPW to raise up the bar and let's get some new mapping done, which was. So previous speaker definitely misspoke, indicating that the mapping methods information for the greater sage grouse mapping that Garfield County had participation in was anything less than transparent. It's absolutely transparent. Documentation is on our website. I spoke to one of those individuals about that in the past, so anyway. Uh, that's what we have for you. We appreciate the work that y'all doing. We look forward and encourage a little more documentation for the next year's process, but we support what you're doing today and hope you adopt the maps as is. Very good. Questions? Commissioner Messmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wynn, for presenting. Um, I think that uh, your discussion about how you provided input um, to CPW on mapping things um, through Garfield County um, and a public process is a, a good example of how different entities have the ability to influence uh, or at least provide their opinions on maps to CPW through the process. So I think that was a, um, I think that was a good point. Um, there was a speaker that asked the question, and so I'll ask it to you, um, about whether that 2019 sage grouse information utilized in your process was part of the um, information that was invalidated by the courts or not. No, the maps aren't invalidated. Okay, so, so that, we're talking today, we're talking about maps, so no. Okay, so the information was not part of that proceeding. The maps were, uh, I, I well, that proceeding, I don't know about the maps specifically, but I'll say that, that 
the categorical exclusion to have BLM utilize the maps as you see them today, that has not been invalidated by anyone. That's who the that's what the feds are using right now on those maps. So um, you talk to your attorney, I can get you some information, some documentation, but no, those maps are solid. The, the court did not say there was anything wrong with the quality of those maps or even speak to, I don't believe, um, the line work for the for the Colorado portion of any maps. Thank you. And I just what just I just want to say one thing. When we engaged, Garfield County initially was the first party to engage on this mapping. It was a big deal. And there's an unfortunate analog to like the mission change rulemaking. What we saw was CPW was required to hand over maps to BLM years ago. This is like 2013, 14. And they said, well, here's the maps we have. And they were these big blobs that basically blotted out Northwest Colorado and said, there's safe grouse in some of these places. The map CPW had were great for what they were doing, which is using to spawn a discussion. And the discussion would include, well, is your site going to be on the ridgetop where the grouse are, or is your site going to be in the valley? But what happened was CPW was, again, their hand was forced, and they handed over the maps they had were totally inappropriate for the purpose, and BLM was going to use those maps to exclude oil and gas activity in total based on a big blob instead of a refined, detailed map. And so, like in the mission change rulemaking, I think there was some, there definitely was some issues with some of the aquatic layers and that sort of thing. They really aren't suited for the purpose that y'all were trying to shoehorn them into. No fault of yours, but you needed a map. And so they need to be updated and they need to be uh, developed appropriately for the purpose you're going to use them for. These sage grouse map are ahead of the curve and they're ready for the purpose that you're going to use them for. And again, CPW as an agency, somehow they're a sister agency, but they've got to play catch up. They've been demanded to produce things for different purposes than what they were initially collecting certain data for. So it's a matter of getting through a process of making sure that in the future updates, the maps are better and better and more suited for your specific purpose. A lot of them are quite suited, but some of them are just a little rougher. And through a future process, I have every confidence it's just going to get better and better, as it should be. That doesn't mean they can't be used today, but they can be better. Are there questions? Seeing no further questions, thank you, Mr. Wen. Appreciate you being with us today. Uh, we now will bring on uh, Mr. Bovey with Threat Range Bald Eagle Studies. Hello. Hello, we can see and hear you. Okay, wonderful. Um, my name is Dana Bovey with Front Range Nesting Bald Eagle Studies. And um, let me see, I, I, why don't I go ahead and share my screen first, make sure that works. Okay, um, I'll get to that uh, exhibit um, towards the end of the, um, the testimony, but you folks can see the uh, exhibit, is that correct? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, first, thanks to the commission for receiving my testimony today. I, I'd like to emphasize that um, our support for earlier testimony by the conservation groups um, Front Range Eagle Studies also wishes to voice our disagreement with the decision by the hearing officer to restrict the commission from considering map, amendment, uh, map amendments offered as expert testimony by party members to this rulemaking update. It's our position that the hearing officer's ruling constitutes a procedural and substantial violation of the COGCC Rules and Administrative Procedures Act. And further, we conclude that the ruling order improperly restricts the scope and purpose of this rulemaking process. Um, and I'll answer um, Commissioner Messner's questions just in a little bit as well. I wanna to get to that. Um, as an indication that the COGCC would comply procedurally in the HPH mapping update 
with the language and spirit of the new rules and the APA, we received an email by um, COGCC Environment, Environmental Manager Greg Geronlo on Jan January 4th, 2022. And in that email, again, you know, just him emailing and talking to us about the, you know, the spirit of, of the rules, um, he stated in quote, the publication of this notice on the HPH mapping update in no way limits the commission's ability to consider additional appropriate input into the process and modify the rule map that is eventually adopted. We certainly welcome, still in quotes, your expertise and on the ground information as part of that and look forward to collaborating with you in this process, end quote. The importance of ensuring an accurate and reliable update to the 2022 HBH maps was further emphasized in Mr. Duranlo's January 4th email to our group in which he stated that, quote, the maps developed through this rulemaking will be the maps that bind operators with respect to oil and gas location planning and permitting and with respect to ongoing operations at existing oil and gas locations where certain rules apply. These maps can only be updated through a formal rulemaking procedure, end quote. And again, that's, that wasn't the, you know, the ruling, um, the hearing officer, that was from uh, Mr. Duran though, but just felt like it was important information to convey. Um, Throughout the 1200 series rulemaking process, our group and other collaborators emphasize the complexities of mapping wildlife in HPH in our state and the need to tap multiple expert sources to get the mapping right and to keep it current. Now, in terms of Commissioner Messner's question to Delia Malone, the Sierra Club, Front Range Bald Eagle Studies did supply our maps of the Middle Roost to COGCC and CPW. And if they were entered into the database and interpreted correctly, the 2A permit for that application by Creston likely would never have been issued. That's number one. Um, my second example, and we'll go to the exhibit on the left that was submitted, um, is you know, to Commissioner Messner's question can be addressed again in the exhibit on the screen. And that was part, this exhibit that's sh the showing on the screen is part of our pre-hearing statement. Um, in November, 2021, we submitted a new Bald Eagle communal roost location to CPW. Um, it's the, the red rectangle up there on, on the screen. Um, that information by email was confirmed to be received, but this exhibit is, is missing data or problem data. And that communal roost never showed up on the COGIS um, CPW's proposed mapping update. And so I just wanted to supply those as two examples of where we have supplied information to CPW and COGCC. And, and it had some serious repercussions when it came to the middle roost um, in that permitting. And also, you know, it could have repercussions yeah. when it comes to not being, you know, a roost where we provided data in November, not showing up on the COGIS database uh, for the proposed map update. And further, you know, these are just, we sent these, and we did, we sent these information to CPW um, of, of sites of in blue golden eagle nests that we didn't see on the COGIS proposed map update. And just a small, this is just a small portion of a you know, of our field study area that we, we checked just to see, you know, if there were some issues. And so we saw that these, just up in this area, these were golden eagle nests that were missing. Um, in, in uh, I don't know what color that is, the um, kind of reddish purple colors. Those are bald eagle nests that I think from explained by CPW in a conversation that I had with one of their staff members that they had considered some of those sites inactive um, 
They said, oh, well, but we have those in our internal databases, but they didn't show up on the proposed update. But they're, you know, those are one, two, three, four, including the Stanley bald eagle nest that everybody knows about that didn't show up as active. And then there was problems with these three green triangles. Those are also bald eagle nests. There were some inconsistencies with those. And I think, you know, to, you know, to the question is that um, we'd like to be able to, and, and anybody, and any other group that, that has available information where we have check CPW's data source and we have supportable information, we'd like to be able to have that recognized by the commission um, because our experience has been that, you know, CPW, you know, we might supply information to CPW, but it may get included or it may not be. And there was a serious repercussion in one of those instances. So just to finalize, um, we provided, input to CPW on map locations as a demonstrated exhibit one uh, for the protection of wildlife from potential harm of oil and gas development, again, assured under 181. Um, we feel like, you know, basically th these type of errors that we've shown in this small area, I mean, we don't fault CPW, there's a for wildlife, it's a, big, it's a big issue. And we feel like if there's a backstop, where things can be checked and what have you, it should be done. And sometimes it doesn't, even if we supply information to, to CPW, it may not get accounted for. So that's where we wish and would like to be able to come in a process like this to have our testimony and have our information and others heard. I think that's it for now, thank you. Thank you, uh, commissioners, questions? Very good. Uh, thank you. And thank you for providing the expert testimony um, to us uh, okay. with regard to mapping. Okay, uh, Ms. Larson, do we have anyone else that uh, we've missed? No, Mr. Chair, we do not. Okay, um, with that, it is what, 1238. I think we're set for a 45-minute break. So return at 1.30, does that work? It's a little longer than 45. All right, let's return at 1.30. Okay, welcome back, uh, commissioners. Good to see you. Hope everybody had a uh, chance to get some lunch. It is 1.30, we are back in session and we are considering docket 21120249. We now have received the information and <clears throat> party witness testimony. I wanted to potentially ask hearings manager Larson um, to raise uh, Director Murphy, um, as well as perhaps Brett Ackerman from CPW to the panel. Um, I think it would be helpful to have a quick discussion about some of the procedural issues that have been raised by the parties today um, with those two individuals. So let's see if we can get that done. Hey there, you two. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to uh, potentially give a chance for some response. Um, we've heard a lot from a lot of different parties, um, kind of all over the place, um, all of it well-intentioned in terms of CPW's process, perhaps our process now that we're gonna be adopting maps on a yearly basis. Um, you know, some folks want, you know, just science to control and appreciate how you're doing it now. Other folks folks have suggested more robust process. 
other folks suggest that perhaps we're not doing enough that we need to do under the APA. I just don't want to put you on the spot, but if you either of you wanted to weigh in on any or all or none of that, uh, here's your opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to want to uh, defer to the director first in case she'd like to weigh in. Mr. Ackerman, you're very gracious. Jump in and I'll, um, I'll add to it if necessary. Thank you, Director Murphy. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, listen in today and to be part of the discussion. And thank you to the commissioners. Uh, again, my name is Brett Ackerman. I'm the Southeast Regional Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm also a member of uh, Parks and Wildlife's executive leadership team under Director Prenslow and uh, have been pleased to be able to participate in the Senate Bill 181 hearings, as well as uh, many other interactions with uh, uh, the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission and, and uh, really enjoy our relationship together and the working relationship that we have uh, between my staff and your staff. Uh, and I think, Mr. Chair, you hit it right on the head. The great thing about Colorado, I say it all the time, is that we love and protect wildlife. We're very serious about it. And I think that's been demonstrated here today. Uh, every single person who got up uh, talked about the importance of protecting wildlife and working in a way that we responsibly develop and do so. You know, when it, when it gets to the details of how we do that, we have some differences of opinion and that's where we generally, you know, the rubber meets the road and we start talking about our procedures and processes. But I did just want to recognize that we come from a very similar place of wanting to, uh, to provide for the future of wildlife in Colorado. And as a wildlife professional, I really appreciate that perspective from the people of the state and the other agencies that we work with. And so I wanted to thank those of them who participated in this specific COGCC process, as well as the Senate Bill 181 hearings, and also take the opportunity to thank the many concerned citizens and data sharing partners and consultants and towns and municipalities and others who consistently help contribute the data that ultimately supply the uh, maps that have been the question of the rulemaking hearing today. You know, as a state, we've set up important and effective habitat identification processes, as well as entities specifically charged with protecting certain parts of our way of life here in Colorado. We have uh, many of those agencies in Colorado um, charged with protecting specific aspects of our life. COGCC and CPW are two of those entities that have an overlapping mission of protecting wildlife within their respective spheres. Uh, CPW has deep expertise. I wanted to reiterate that um, and make sure that that's on the record. Uh, that's deep and nationally and even world-renowned expertise in assessing habitats and renowned expert scientists within the wildlife management world, which is appropriate. The CPW is the entity the people of the state have set up to manage wildlife in the state. But that said, there are, there are also others in our state who have expertise in, in diverse aspects of wildlife habitat assessment and wildlife management. We've seen some of those here today. Um, we maintain a consistent dialogue with many of those groups. Uh, there are some here today that have talked about the difficulty in, in, in conversation with us. And I would point out that, that really it's just a conversation with us. Uh, for all those who have wanted to engage with us, we've engaged. Now that said, we're not always on the same page, but we continue to engage. We maintain a consistent dialogue. As Dr. Voltero pointed out, many of us, uh, many of those groups provide us with ongoing data on a year by year basis. Uh, individuals also have an opportunity to provide information and data at any time that can be considered and vetted by our agency experts. So it's been stated here today, and I would reiterate that CPW does have an open door policy to the receipt of information and data. Uh, rather than in the form of testimony or hearings, as was pointed out by Commissioner McGowan, it's in the form of really open source gathering of scientific information. And, and that's purposefully intended to be more open and transparent to the public rather than less so. Uh, we intend to make it easy for folks to engage with us in order to take in that data. It's been affirmed today that those who have reached out to CPW have been engaged and when factually supported have contributed to our data sets. So you've also heard today that it's important that the data in these maps be scientifically accurate and properly vetted. I couldn't agree more. Uh, inclusion of all the data that we receive um, annually into our habitat maps uh, de facto would not be appropriately doing our job as wildlife management professionals. Conversely, refusal to consider information provided would also not be appropriately doing our job. So the data that is provided to our agency is gathered into our processes, considered by teams of experts, not uh, openly uh, you know, dismissed by one person internally in a black box, and as appropriate included into our data sets and maps. 
In some cases, there are results that come through vetting that modify the received, the received data. Uh, as is the case of our last commenter this morning who demonstrated that some of the nests identified in the pre-hearing statement weren't included in CPWHPH maps. This is an example of the process working uh, rather than not working as those sites were further ground truth. Some were included, some were not for, the very, for various reasons, such as some nests have been destroyed, uh, at least one was submitted confidentially by the landowner and, and other specific reasons, rather than just uh, going into a process and, and not emerging. Uh, and, Admittedly, if the status of those nests changes in 2022, that will be noted. Locations will be referred for consultations uh, under the rule 309E on on-ramps and updated for future maps. Uh, if nest data is submitted directly to CPW, we can and do consider this information and it's, and it's the quickest way for us to do so. But we take it in in a multitude of ways. I also wanted to reiterate, again, a point that's been made today, Mr. Chair, that the HPH maps are triggers. They have on-ramps and off-ramps. And so I think it's been pointed out here today, and I would concede that are these maps perfect in their current state? Not absolutely perfect, no, but they are the best information that we have right now, and that's consistently updated and perfected. And these maps are used appropriately, in my opinion, by CODCC, not as catch-all uh, regulations that then defer uh, and, and, and specifically state what someone can or can't do it, can't do, but instead they're used as triggers to begin the conversation for areas that may be sensitive wildlife habitat. Um, as the agency charged with management of Colorado's wildlife, we take that responsibility very seriously. I wanted to reassert CPW's preference and dedication to first avoid, then minimize, and then mitigate for wildlife impacts in that order. These maps uh, are created with input from dozens of educated CPW wildlife experts, and in some cases, as Dr. Walter pointed out, over decades. And it is very important for CPW's wildlife professionals to ensure the integrity of these maps, not only for the oil and gas industry, but for other land use proposals that we comment on uh, throughout the state. Um, it is worth noting that these maps were provided on December 31st of last year, and a stakeholder meeting was held on January 18th to discuss uh, the maps, both of which were made widely known to interested parties. But that said, this is COGCC's first year administratively updating the HPH maps since the 181 rule adoption. And it makes sense to continue to discuss improvements to the process. Uh, CPW is certainly open to uh, talking with COGCC about how we can do that. And uh, very much thanks uh, COGCC for the opportunity to participate and to provide expert expertise and uh, in this case, uh, use our expertise to form what I believe is the best data set in Colorado uh, to trigger consultations associated with habitat that may be of concern when uh, planning oil and gas development. So it's kind of my uh, smattering of thoughts, Mr. Chair, but I certainly would be happy to address any specific points that commissioners would like to address that have come up today or uh, answer any other questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I <clears throat> appreciate that. And I know that um, we've all just heard from our various stakeholders, all of whom bring uh, important, critical, uh, uh, and good stakeholder for us. Um, and so, um, you know, one thing, you know, and I'm hopeful, you know, you, you mentioned about process improvement. This is our first time. But, um, you know, I think there are methods for process improvement. Um, and that can be developed as we, you know, get ready three months ahead of next year when we get ready to do that. And um, I think there's been some good ideas. And I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that CPW, as well as, you know, Greg Duano and our division and others will help to ensure that some of the concerns that were raised are addressed uh, in a manner that is, is productive for CPW. And then uh, by way of, of segue to COGCC as we look at the map. So thank you for being available this afternoon. Do any commissioners have questions for this panel that I've quickly hobbled to? Commissioner McGowan? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and um, thanks for being here, Mr. Ackerman. I, I'm wondering, after you've heard some of the comments about folks feeling like they would like a more formalized process. I understand what you're saying, which is you can connect with us all throughout the year. Um, animals move, the map is going to be a living document that's gonna change every year. 
but you all don't have obviously enough people to keep track of everything. So I think it's a valuable tool that you have kind of boots on the ground um, experts to help you figure out where some of this important habitat might be. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about if what a, a more formalized process might look like for you all to fit into our next hearing as we try this again and try to Im keep improving the processes. I think there were a couple of suggestions and I would certainly want CPW's feedback about what we might wanna do to improve upon how, we're, how we've done it this first go around. Um, I think one of the suggestions was to have some sort of formalized meeting or unveiling of a draft map um, in the fall preceding the, you know, the February when, we, when we're gonna take it up if we, if we approve the new February date and then a chance for folks to give feedback to the map and a kind of a back and forth a little bit before it comes to the commission or should that be with the commission's participation or do you want time to think about it? I guess I should throw that on the table too. Thank you for the question, Commissioner McGowan. It's a great question and uh, certainly have been pondering that as we've been talking here today. And I do think it, it would be just fine and appropriate to produce those maps you know, earlier on in the rulemaking hearing process so that folks can take a look at them. And then it gives them an opportunity to have pointed, uh, provide any pointed data that they'd like to provide um, directly to us. Uh, you know, there is a lag between producing maps and vetting data. And so, you know, we'd have to have a lot of talk about process and how that would work. But in the end, if that would be helpful, I certainly were open to considering, uh, you know, timelines associated with getting maps to you that then folks can take a look at and specifically identify concerns where they think the biological data is mistaken or could be added to. Um, and and uh, we can, you know, have a little bit longer of a process if COGCC is amenable to that. I would say that um, a, a couple of points associated with that are that we'd have to talk about timeline. You know, in the fall would be a little bit harder because we were right at the beginning of our map uh, compiling process. And so that would be using the maps from the previous year. And so we'd have to talk about timing and I don't wanna belabor that point, but that's something that we should talk about. And I also would point out that the, you know, there were three months that these data and maps were out there. And so maybe some degree of continued publication and helping people uh, become aware uh, that that data is out there, that they're welcome to you know, take a look at and engage us on um, as you know, we didn't have feedback uh, during the three months that it was out there uh, at this, you know, this juncture. So I think, I think more publication and making people aware of their ability to reach out and to engage might be helpful. I think that's super helpful and, and good feedback. I, Cause I think for me personally, as a commissioner, I, I'm not sure I would be comfortable with someone at a hearing all of a sudden presenting something that they think is missing from the map and then CPW not having the chance to look at it and say, this is why we disagreed and we didn't add it to the map or um, this is the first we're hearing of this. We really can't opine about whether or not it should be added. Feels kind of like a sloppy hearing process for us. So if, we, if there's some way for us to, um, to get that feedback to you all and a chance for you to respond upstream before it gets in front of the commission for deliberation. I think that's helpful. Thank you, commissioner. And my suggestion would be if, if the uh, commission is amenable for our staff and COGCC to meet uh, this spring and talk about the potential process. Thank you, commissioner. Other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Messner? Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Mr. Ackerman, for your comments. I, I appreciate your perspective on that, uh, on the on the process that we're going through. Um, I did so. I I was very interested uh, and appreciated the perspective that Mr. Hulse brought to um, to the rulemaking um, testimony, particularly the benefits of uh, having an apolitical and science-based review of high priority habitat maps and the advantage of having some of the input being provided on a rolling basis versus a formalized rulemaking type of, um, type of situation or, or formal stakeholder process. Um, and so I guess my question to you is, I mean, do you, 
in your professional opinion, I mean, which do you think is most effective from, from that standpoint? Obviously, I assume because you're doing it you know, on a rolling basis, you may find that the most effective way of, of receiving information from different stakeholders throughout the year. Um, but then the second piece is some of the stakeholders brought up the um, some concerns that perhaps not enough documentation or evidence is being provided um, when those maps are introduced to meet APA standards. So I guess I would be curious your thoughts or, or Director Murphy's thoughts on that. Sure, and thank you, Commissioner Messner. I appreciate that question. I appreciated Mr. Holst's comments as well. And uh, this is an issue that, that uh, I think there are a number of ways that data can be gathered. Um, and so whether it's done a, a point by point uh, at specific meetings uh, or whether it's done ad hoc over time, um, it can be done accurately either way. What I do think is important is a statement about uh, this being based biological data that really needs to be apolitical data. And I think, uh, you know, when we talk about this data being influenced, it should be influenced by good scientific data that's verified, embedded in ground truth. And I've heard that a number of times here today. I think that uh, that, that would be the consensus amongst most people that are talking about that. Um, CPW as an agency does have rulemaking authority as well. And uh, if you'll permit me just a little license, we, we have a number of processes that we do reach out to the public and gain public, uh, have public hearings and take public testimony. And, uh, and those testimonies um, politically influence uh, some of our actions. For example, we have herd management plans where we could manage biologically towards the top end of a herd or biologically towards the bottom end of herd numbers. And we take scientific or we take uh, sociological data that help us understand what the public prefers and we manage towards that end. Uh, when it comes to base biological data, it really is a different animal. Um, base biological data is, as you pointed out, scientific data, and we're a scientific agency, and we manage, uh, we're scientists who manage scientifically with scientific data. And it's important to us that it is, uh, that that data, that base data, is informed by the public, but not necessarily politicized in any way. Um, and in that way, we maintain the integrity of that data uh, for this process and for all other processes. So. As far as the gathering process, I know that wasn't a direct answer to your question. I think there are a number of ways. I, I do like the ad hoc as it gives uh, anyone that wants to a 24 seven open door policy to engage us and start talking about where they think things are good or where they think things are bad. Thank I, I think thank you for that question or the answer. Um, I think the second part of that, and I was just curious perspective on it was the the level of documentation or or evidence provided in in kind of that ad hoc or rolling basis, and whether um, in your professional opinions that that does or does not meet um, that APA standard for a state agency. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. I appreciate that question. Sorry, I didn't catch that on the first uh, in the first go around, but thanks for reiterating. And uh, first and foremost, obviously, I'm not an attorney. Um, I did manage CPW's regulatory process for quite some time, so I do have significant experience with uh, the rulemaking processes and the APA. And reliance upon a, uh, a, an established scientific agency for data is a well-accepted, um, incorporated by reference and, and other ways, uh, whether it's incorporated by reference or included directly in regulations, is an accepted the legal process for rulemaking bodies, and in my opinion, passes APA muster, uh, but would certainly defer that question to the Attorney General's office. In the end, I think um, that the meat of that question kind of dives deeper into CPW's process in, uh, in talking with the public about the methods that it uses to reach the conclusions that it reaches outside of a rulemaking context. And I think there, there probably are so, is some room for improvement uh, in that context uh, with regard to this uh, process. Thank you. I appreciate the responses. Further questions? Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for allowing us to uh, bring uh, this quick panel of uh, COGCC and CPW to the fore. At this time, um, we are at that spot in which we are 
done with questions and answers, and we are moving into deliberations. Does anybody care to initiate deliberations? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I along the lines of what Commissioner Mesner, I think is, is trying to get at um, is whether or not a, a rolling iterative process that happens throughout the year is going to meet APA requirements for a rulemaking that we would have as a commission and, and how will we make a decision and how we get public feedback and input. I, I don't know if, if there's an answer to that or if AAG Davenport has an opinion um, about what the requirements for the APA process are when we have hearings and, and pro providing opportunity for public input. Not seeing AAG Davenport showing up quickly and putting my lawyer hat on, which I still have, um, I think there is an opportunity for both to occur, for CPW to do its rolling map updates over the course of the year, and then to bring the, the maps to us. I think I agree with the parties that indicated that having today's sort of uh, briefing earlier on in the process and perhaps with additional documentation would be not only helpful to the process, but more satisfactory to the APA um, so that we you know, have the appropriate information before us um, at an earlier stage. I'm comfortable with where we are today, but I think there is some process improvement that we can get at. Having said all that, now that AG Davenport is with us, let's let them correct whatever needs to be corrected. Thank you. My apologies for the delay in showing up. Um, Commissioner McGowan, Mr. Chair, I, I don't, I agree that I think there is an iterative process that could comply with the APA and it would involve the commission's rulemaking process as well. Uh, in short, I, I don't disagree with anything that the chair said. And I think that depending on the intricacies of the process, sort of an iterative process with CDPHE and then built into the commission's rulemaking process as well could comply with the APA. Follow up to that, Commissioner McGowan. Yes, thank you. And I just wanna make sure that, I, that I'm clear, right? That um, while CPW I think is saying they, they take information throughout the year, the map only actually gets updated annual, um, at most annually through our rules. And so at some point in time, the map becomes static, if that's the word I can use. And that's the thing that people are responding to and saying, yes, we think this, this reflects where sensitive habitat is, high priority habitat is, 1202 BC, all these things, right? Okay. And so, it, um, I'm not trying to change CPW's process for how they get information throughout the year and how they use it and how they add to their map. I'm trying to figure out what then we as a commission then in order to make sure that we're meeting any require APA requirements as part of our rulemaking. I, I think we have to say, so now stop. This is the static map. This is what's gonna be adopted by the commission and it will be used for the next year minimum. And this is what we want folks to respond to. And, and can those responses and the feedback go back and forth between CPW and stakeholders and then it comes to us for deliberation or can or should the commission be a part of that conversation before it gets to, to us? At some point, so this is, I think this is what I'll say because I don't want to foreclose. I think this is going to, how this process is going to work is going to be an iterative process in itself. I think it'll be, so there'll be some additional conversations after today. So I don't want to foreclose any ideas right now. What I will say is yes, at some point, the map does need to become the map that the commission is considering adopting. And that likely is the point at least at the initial stage where the rulemaking is noticed. The rulemaking is noticed, the map is sent out, this is the map the commission is considering adopting. As this commission is very well aware, rules 
can change in the course of the rulemaking process between the notice and the final adopted version of the rules. So there could be additional changes, things that the commission approves a different map than the one that was noticed with the rulemaking. And how exactly those changes get made, how exactly people propose those changes through the commission's rulemaking process is where I say, I think that's a process that we can figure, you know, we can continue to think about and figure out before the next high priority habitat map rulemaking. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and um, I'm, not, I, I'm not trying to solve the problem today. I think that, some stakeholders seem concerned that we were um, relinquishing authority that we have um, about the map and adopting the map to a, 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 another agency. But I do feel that that agency has an appropriate role, the most appropriate role to play uh, in that consultation process with the commission. And so I'm just trying to make sure that we have the right balance, however it is that we decide to to move forward. Um, so I appreciate your feedback and thank you. Just to segue off that last point there, Commissioner McGowan, I, I, you know, I don't look at it as a cedence of authority. Um, I think we have authority to adopt the map CPW provides to us. I think we have authority to adopt maps that are a little bit different. Uh, based upon input. I think we have authority to not adopt maps if we don't think them meet muster. Um, I, I think we have authority to defer to CPW and therefore to just adopt their maps. Um, and I mentioned earlier on, um, you know, having read that through the various uh, pleadings, I wanted to sort of hear everybody out today before I got to whether, you know, what my spot is on the conclusion and you know, I think we're, as one commissioner, I'm in a good spot to be comfortable with the maps that CPW has provided to us. And I will be a yes vote. I think we, you know, they've, they've done a good job. Um, I have not seen, there was, you know, some consternation amongst parties that they wanted to be able to provide additional science. Well, I think that's the opportunity for, the yearly rolling process with CPW. If you've got science, go take it to CPW. Then next year, we'll update the map again. I also am very much influenced by the fact that the maps, while statically adopted today, perhaps, um, are just a starting point for our review of wildlife issues. Um, I heard that from uh, the CPW officials. I heard that from Director Murphy. And so when we go and do an in-depth review of a potential ODGDP or CAP or whatever it may be, that's a starting point. But on the ground, ground truthing is how we ultimately ensure avoidance, minimization, and mitigation of impacts of wildlife from oil and gas development. So I guess I just now started deliberations. Does anybody else desire to get into the deliberative game? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my, I think your perspective is good. Um, you know, I think COGCC does have the authority to determine the adequacy of you know, any of the utilized information, including the provided HBH maps to ensure protection of wildlife resources. Um, you know, I, I have been contemplating the potentially the processes for providing input and, and documentation in particular, particular to the update uh, updated maps um, could be improved. Um, I also acknowledge that this is the first time that we've done this and that we'll continue as with everything to improve our processes. But I, I see no evidence that the proposed maps do not create a strong base layer of information to guide the potential impacts to wildlife from oil and gas activities. Um, in addition, I think that the on-ramps, even the off-ramps uh, developed in rules 309E create the ability to ground truth specific OGDP applications uh, to ensure wildlife protections. Um, I do strongly encourage the utilization of rule 309E2D 
uh, that would require that that would allow CPW to require consultation if evidence is present that potential impacts to unmapped high priority habitat um, could occur from oil and gas activities. Um, and I think that's potentially um, something to consider as more and more information is developed around migratory corridors and pinch points and stopovers. Um, uh, I think that evidence has the opportunity to I think that evidence in general has the opportunity to be presented on a rolling basis uh, to CPW, which I think can be a really strong opportunity. Um, I think maybe some additional information from CPW on how best to do that and who best to do that to could be helpful to different stakeholders in the public. Um, I also think that as part of the public comment and stakeholder comment portions in our OGDP reviews, either through the technical review or through the commission reviews or another opportunities to present information. Um, I do agree that the process of developing HBH maps should strive to be apolitical and science-based uh, and that CPW is our agency's professionals in this field. Uh, and I do really appreciate the work that they do. Um, I, I, while I think it is appropriate for this commission to decide whether the CPW high priority habitat maps alone are adequate to meet the responsibilities of the act, I think future rulemakings on high priority habitat maps should also allow for input on that up or down vote, including why or why not they may, why or why not they may not be adequate or are adequate. Um, I think that's valuable information for us to have during the commission rulemaking hearings. Um, and, you know, having, having said that, um, you know, I do find that the high priority habitat maps as presented, you know, are an adequate base layer of information uh, to review in conjunction with the other elements of uh, the 300 and 1200 series rules, so. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, th thanks, Chair, and and I will uh, I'll, I'll start off just by saying that that I do support this map update, and and I will be voting in favor of it. Um, I understand the concerns that have been shared by the state by the stakeholders that we've heard from today, um, and the ones that submitted a testimony that that we didn't hear from. Um, with regard to the engagement process and the basis for this iteration of the map updates, you know CPW does have a process that allows for input from any stakeholder. And that information is then verif verified by CPW within their expertise. And I think for any stakeholders that had a problem with this iteration and look to participate in the next iteration, you know, the, the process for that engagement starts today. It, start, it could start yesterday, it could start tomorrow, but you've got till the end of the year to help influence what this next map looks like. Um, and I think that's important, right? And perhaps that was a gap in the knowledge, that was a gap in the understanding by stakeholders, and, and, and hopefully we've closed that gap with the information we heard from CPW um, this morning and then just now from Mr. Ackerman. Um, and so I encourage, uh, you know, folks to, 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 to engage um, at that level, and, and hopefully it, it will lead to a, a more robust um, uh, map um, update next year. Not, not that this one wasn't robust, but, but perhaps robust in the nature of its, uh, its support and um, its, uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's um, supports the right word, right? I'm losing my, losing track here, right? It, it's support from, from those stakeholders. So, um, so that's my guidance there. I think necessarily as we notice a rulemaking that the data that we base that rulemaking on, you know, it does become stale at some point. That's just the nature of us having a static product that comes out of a rulemaking. And I think that having a static map or a map that is set in a, in a snapshot in time for the purpose of what we do um, as a commission and what the agency does, it helps provide us the right guidance and it helps provide us the right expectations for the matters that, that come before us. And so in that regard, I think that, that the process does um, have opportunities for improvement. This is our first shot out of the gates, and I think that uh, it will get better over the next year, and I encourage stakeholders to continue their engagement with both, uh, with both us and CPW along the way. I have my video off because I'm having Wi-Fi problems, but I do see everybody. Commissioner McGowan? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to my fellow commissioners. I, I don't necessarily disagree with anything that's been um, said thus far. I, I will um, agree that the the map seems appropriate to me, and it has been appropriately put together by the the experts, which is CPW, and I think that they have a process that folks can go through. I agree with Commissioner Gonzalez that maybe folks didn't understand what the process was to feed into CPW's mapping methodology and process. That being said, at some point that map does become static and it's the map that the commission uses for at least a year to make decisions and as a screening tool, and I agree it's a screening tool. And then as we hone in on specific locations, there's an opportunity um, to give the commission more detailed information about sensitive habitat or species. And, and that's an opportunity that should be that should be used. It would be helpful, I think, in our next process um, for CPW to give a presentation like they did to the commission today about what the methodology was that they used, how they came up with the maps and provide an, an opportunity for folks to give specific feedback on that static map and for CPW to be able to respond before it gets to the commission so that the commission isn't having to make, uh, to Commissioner Mesner's point, any sort of kind of political decisions about habitat, but that that the response, the back and forth has happened, and we feel that um, a good conversation has been had, and the the map is based on good science. But I am a yes vote on the the map today. I think that it was a good starting a good starting point. I think the presentation from CPW um, showed me that they thought had, were thoughtful, thought it through, and they had experts looking at it, and that there were some folks. Who understood this iterative process and did feed into the map process before um, sending it to us for adoption for our purposes. I'm also supportive, even though I agree, we have the authority to amend or change the map. I don't think we have to just do an up and down vote. As a as for this commissioner, I would prefer though that we have a map that aligns with maps that CPW is using for other purposes and other stakeholders so that we don't end up with inconsistencies or confusion about where habitat is and why we use a map differently from everybody else that might be using maps for um, CPW, with CPW for other purposes, so. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with that, I think we're looking for a motion to approve the CPW maps, as well as a motion, motion to change the date and the definition from January 15th to February 28th. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thanks everyone for the good work uh, this year on HPH Maps. We will see you again next year and we invite you to go visit with CPW on a rolling basis between now and then. Uh, commissioners, I would like to take a 10 minute break and try to reboot my Wi-Fi. Um, I'm getting tremendous problems. So uh, it is 210. If, if we could indulge me and come back at 220, we'll take up our next docket. All right, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, I hesitate to ask, but can you see me and hear me okay? Okay, I, I did reboot Wi-Fi wi -Fi and reboot state computer, so maybe I can get it through the rest of the day. Apologies for that. Um, we now will take up uh, Noble Energy Docket 21040029, a request for the commission to issue a sub supplemental order declaring Noble's West County unit Effective as of the date, the commission entered order number 535-1352, approving the plan of unit operations being July 14th, 2021. That is a mouthful, but it did allow for Ms. Fulcher to be able to show up. So we, I believe, are ready to hear from you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And if you will permit me just one second to start sharing my screen. I will get that up and running. And just for, for the commission staff's purposes, we also have um, Matt Otnis and Patricia Minerich, 
who may need to be elevated to panelists at some point during the course of the hearing, as well as Jim Martin. I'll cover that here momentarily. Um, but again, just I will start sharing my screen here. All right, are y'all with me with a slide deck? Yes. Good deal. All right. Well, good afternoon, commissioners. It's great to see all of you. Again, Jill Fulcher, an attorney with Beatty and Wozniak here today on behalf of Noble Energy. And joining me today is my partner at Beatty and Wozniak, Jim Martin, and Matt Otnis, who is an asset land manager with Noble, and also Patricia Minerich, who is a regulatory and deal advisor for Noble. And so what we've prepared for you today um, are just, a, it's a very high level PowerPoint summarizing this very, uh, it's a mouthful as the chair said, uh, uh, in terms of teeing this up and yet it's pretty limited issue for you today. So we've got some slides that I'm gonna walk you through. And then at the conclusion of those slides, we're happy to answer questions. So I'm gonna begin by asking you to recall a previous matter that you heard last summer. You may recall back in July of 2021, this commission considered an application brought by Noble Energy to approve the West Pony State Unit for primary recovery operations. And if you recall, this, the West Pony State Unit is approximately 17,500 acres of land in unincorporated Weld County. And um, that application resulted in an order approving the, those lands for uh, primary recovery uh, again, for cooperative development and unit operations. And so you probably recall that at that hearing, we presented you with technical evidence uh, supporting the application that included engineering evidence and geologic evidence establishing that the unit was necessary to prevent waste and protect correlative rights. And we also provided you with the unit agreement and unit operating agreement governing unit operations. And uh, you had the opportunity to review those documents and you were satisfied that those documents and the plan for operations and the technical evidence satisfied all of the requirements under the act and you approved the state pony unit. Um, that order contained a few conditions and one of the conditions that was baked into that order is also, it derives from the statute itself, which is uh, section 118.5 in particular, which requires unit operations to be approved by at least 80% of cost-bearing owners and non-cost-bearing interest owners before the unit can be fully effective. So that was one of the conditions um, of your order and that's why we're here today. So that moves me to my next slide, why we're here. And we are here for the sole purpose of providing you uh, with evidence to establish that Noble has obtained those requisite approvals from the cost-bearing and non-cost-bearing interest owners such that this unit can be fully effective. Um, so that's the only thing we're asking you to look at today. And we have already provided you with uh, written testimony and evidence as part of your portfolios that Noble to date has obtained approximately 84.26% approval of unit operations from cost-bearing interest owners or working interest owners. And um, this is reflected in Mr. Otnes's written testimony and also on exhibit L4, uh, specifically each of the working interest owners that have uh, approved the plan for unit operations to date, and then approximately 84.45% of the non-cost-bearing interest owners in the unit, uh, think of leased mineral owners, if you will, have approved the unit um, to date, and this would be reflected in Exhibit L3 and also in Mr. Otnes's testimony. So not only has Noble uh, obtained the 80% consensus necessary, but we're almost 5% uh, over that minimum threshold requirement for you to deem the unit effective. And, um, and so that is the evidence that has been presented in your packets and in your portfolio. A little bit more about the supplemental application. Uh, it was filed December of last year. This application and the notice of hearing have been served on all locatable interested parties pursuant to your rules. And uh, that includes uh, hundreds of parties that have been served this information as required by Rule 504. And the notice of hearing was also published in local papers for five weeks. There were no petitions filed against the supplemental application under Rule 507. And there was one public comment that was uploaded to your e-filing system over the weekend by Ms. Sharon Brandt, um, which I am going to address here momentarily. Uh, but considering this was mailed to hundreds of parties, um, there's really 
pretty limited involvement here today, uh, if you'll notice, on, on this application. And what we think that does is really underscore what has been a very positive response, um, really, from the project to date. And so I um, did want to mention, though, that uh, that's where things stand with respect to satisfaction of notice, publication, and where things stand with respect to public comment. We did want to take an opportunity to provide you with a bit of an overview on the progress in the West Pony unit to date. Uh, you may also recall from our hearing uh, back over the summer that there are several obligations uh, that are put on to Noble as the unit operator, both within the unit agreement and on um, Andrew order. And one of those obligations is to drill a test well in the West Pony unit area uh, by, or excuse me, within one year of the date that you approved the unit operations. And that would be by July 14th of this year. And we are right on track to meet that requirement. The Coomer LE23668 well will be the test well in this unit. The form two has been approved by the director. Uh, no OGDP has been presented to you uh, on that well because that well will be drilled from an existing and constructed pad and did not trigger revised 2A. Uh, but that estimated spud date is here in just a few weeks. So we're right on target to meet that test well drilling requirement. And likewise, um, your order also conditioned approval on Noble submitting to you a comprehensive area plan and having that cap approved by the time we are required to uh, start full-scale development. And we also are pleased to report that we think we're right on target uh, with respect to the cap planning. Uh, the, the work on the cap has commenced internally to Noble. That would include preliminary location siting, surveys, eco-node design, uh, all of that, uh, of that early early leg work that attends cap the cap process, and again, we we believe we're right on track to achieve that cap requirement in the time we need to satisfy that term of your order. So we did want to provide you with that update while we had the chance. Um, so that then takes me into the uh, public comment by Ms. Brandt, because we did want to address that before we summarize for you and then just open it up for questions. Um, Ms. Brandt's comment that was received over the weekend uh, indicated a couple of things. It seemed to us that Ms. Brandt um, was taking issue with her interest being recognized as committed to the West Pony unit as part of Mr. Otnes's Exhibit L3, uh, and then also took issue with the percentage overall of her interest in the, in the unit. She seemed to, to indicate that her entire uh, mineral interest in the unit wasn't reflected on that exhibit. And so we're going to take those issues, walk those issues um, through those issues with these couple of slides, but did want to provide you assurances that we, we reviewed the issue and um, can confirm that exhibit L3 is accurate as to Ms. Brandt's interest. Um, so quickly, Ms. Brandt owns approximately 0.15% leased mineral interest in the West Pony unit. Uh, that interest is fully leased, so Ms. Brandt would be considered a non-cost bearing owner. And Ms. Brandt's interest is... Uh, subject to five existing oil and gas leases, so spread across five leases, each of which have all been recorded in Weld County, in the Weld County land records. And what we've done is we've listed the reception numbers for each of those five leases below this sub bullet, uh, where you could find those leases in the Weld County land records. And uh, Noble uh, would agree that Ms. Brandt has not ratified or otherwise approved unit operations as to four of the five leases. Um, but one of the leases, the lease that we've bolded here for you, uh, and it's reception number 4636403, does ratify unit operations. It authorizes Noble to commit Ms. Brandt's interest under that lease to unit operations. And so what we've done here is just, we provided you a direct screenshot from that lease. Um, this is the operative language that grants Noble the right to commit the, the lease or any portion of that lease and the interest that derives under that lease to a plan for unit operations just like this. Um, and so this is uh, the lease language, uh, as I said. And so that's the interest and that's the lease that's been committed to unit operations under exhibit L3. Um, so we've credited 0.05% of Ms. Brandt's total interest as approving unit operations. And that's deriving from one of five leases. But likewise, we've not credited the remaining four leases that cover Ms. Brandt's interests to supporting unit operations, because those four leases do not contain that same language that I highlighted for you on the previous slide. And Ms. Brandt has not otherwise joined the unit as to those four leases by any other written agreement or contract with Noble. So that's why her whole 0.15% interest is not reflected on exhibit three L3, just a portion. 
And that's also why um, that, that smaller subset of interest is accurately reflected on Exhibit L3. So this information has been communicated to Ms. Brandt. Uh, folks from Noble reached out to her Monday uh, and had this discussion with, with she, I believe, and maybe her husband. Um, and so this information has been explained. Um, and like any other party in the unit, Noble is going to be always available to answer those questions from her, uh, from her, uh, from her relatives that are also listed on that comment or any other party. Um, but we did want to provide you assurances that that Exhibit 3 was reviewed very carefully before we submitted it and then was re-reviewed following Ms. Brandt's comment and is an accurate depiction of the folks that have committed interest to the unit and, um, and in what proportions. So that's gonna take me to just a summary slide for you and then we'll, we'll kick off questions should you have any. Um, again, Nobles complied with all of the notice requirements under your rules for this application. This application is uncontested. And again, we had one public comment. Um, we've secured the approvals from all necessary cost-bearing and non-cost-bearing interest owners, again, almost 5% over what would have been required for the unit to be effective. And uh, we've got testimony in the record as to when those approvals were obtained. And those approvals were obtained within that six month requirement from the July 14th order. Uh, so with that, we would ask that uh, following today's hearing, you approve the hearing officer's recommended order and deem the West Pony unit fully effective. So that's gonna conclude my walkthrough of our presentation. Uh, I, will, I will exit the share screen mode. And again, we are um, here for questions. Questions from commissioners. Commissioner Gonzalez. Th thanks, Chair, and thanks, Ms. Fulcher, for the presentation. Um, I do have one, qu one question. I just want to make sure I, I understand what you just said in terms of the Exhibit L3. Um, is my understanding correct that the Exhibit L3 was correct as part of the application, was correct subsequent to um, Ms. Brandt's uh, comments, uh, and, and no changes were made in that regard? She was just perhaps, uh, um, uh, perhaps incorrect in, in her understanding as to where her interests were captured on that exhibit? Thank you for the question, Commissioner. That's correct. So no changes have been made to that exhibit. And I think it's just a, um, uh, I think it was just a matter of clarification to, to the Brants and to Ms. Brant in particular on that issue. Uh, but again, yeah, no changes were made and the exhibit is accurate. Thank you. Other questions? I don't have any either. Seeing no further questions, uh, we move into deliberations. Uh, does any commissioner desire to start that? Commissioner Gonzalez? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, and this is a, a pretty pretty simple um, request of relief that comes before us in terms of the threshold of ownership um, and the threshold of written um, uh, permission uh, that has been granted a, by the revenue receiving owners and the working interest owners um, in the proposed unit um, based on the testimony that was provided to us in the written documentation it looks to me like they noble has um, well exceeded the 80 percent threshold um, in both accounts and i would move to approve um i would move to uh, i'm tr trying to frame this the right way i want to make sure that i do um, to approve Noble's request, or I guess to confirm that Noble has met the 80% threshold. Is that what we're doing here? We're confirming that, issuing a finding, Chair? AG Davenport is unmuting. Go ahead. Yeah, he can help me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for being off video. I'm having internet issues as well. Um, yes, you're accurately describing, Commissioner Gonzalez, what we're doing here. I don't think you need to try to um, wordsmith a motion too carefully i think you can simply approve the application Fair enough. in this matter and that would be enough i move to approve the application in this matter thank you Thank Mr. You. we have a motion and a second is there further discussion seeing none all those in favor indicate by saying aye aye, aye. any opposed motion carries uh, thank you, Ms. Fulcher. Um, you have received the relief you requested. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Appreciate your time. Okay. Um, commissioners, we have one other docket today. 
Uh, it is a TEP OGDP, and I've been informed they need about five minutes to get ready. It's 2.37, let's get back at 2.42-ish, and then we'll take that up. All right, um, <clears throat> welcome back. Uh, this is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Um, we are taking up docket number 21110224, TEP Rocky Mountain, the Pitcher's Mound Oil and Gas Development Plan. Um, we did have one member of the public sign up for public comment. Uh, that person was Wes Wilson with Be the Change. Uh, I have looked and I cannot find Mr. Wilson. If he is in the meeting, if he could raise his hand and we will recognize him. Um, let's give a second or two for that to occur or not. And if not, then we would go straight into a presentation by TEP. And we wanna thank Mr. Jewell and TEP for accommodating the fact that we are a little early and we were not supposed to take you up until tomorrow, but uh, this is um, a good way to uh, take it up today. So, I do not see any hands having been raised. And so with that, I will give the floor to Mr. Jewell. Well, Mr. Chair, I will say we like efficiencies as much as you do. So my only regret is that in my coat handy would have been a little more dapper for you. But that aside, thank you very much. Good afternoon. For the record, Michael Jewell with Jewell Jimerson Natural Resources Law. On behalf of TEP Rocky Mountain LLC, we are up to date on our financial assurances and tend to keep it that way. Thank you for your kind attention and consideration. We're kind of looking at part two today of something that we discussed last week and uh, different mechanisms, different facts here that are involved though that we will uh, get into. But thank you so much for your time so far. Before we get too far along, as always, we want to thank key staff, especially Dave Kubesko and Ginger Malachowskis this time and the rest of the C COGCC technical staff for your insights and feedback in getting this application submitted properly. So for the record, we're presenting you today docket number 21110224 for TEP Rocky Mountain LLC's Pitcher's Mound Water Recycling Facility, OGDT, OGDP. We're asking you to approve an order for an approximate 18.68 acre OGDP pursuant to rules 303 and 503 G1 for the application lands to expand an existing pad the federal RGU 2335-198 and construct and operate the Pitcher's Mound Water Recycling Facility for the treatment, storage, recycling, and beneficial use and disposal of reduced water generated from existing and future natural gas wells. This is on lands Township 1 South, Range 98 West, uh, Section 35, and certain lots there, 7, 8, 10, 11, and 12. So preliminaries aside, uh, just one more important to note, we come to you without any protest, either formal or even informal, uh, asking our staff if there's been any contact or any concerns, um, or especially with persons who may not know to go the formal route, but we have nothing to report to you there. The statement of basis and purpose states that the commission recognizes that reusing and recycling produced water provides significant benefits for water quantity, the ecosystems, wildlife, agriculture operations, and recreational industries that rely on healthy waterways, especially in areas where in Colorado where water is scarce. As opposed to other basins that are high on oil activity in Colorado, production in the Piants invites a highly mitigated use of produced water resources that significantly offset the need to procure and use fresh water, which can therefore be preserved for other beneficial uses. That's the goal here. The Pitcher's Mound Water Recycling Facility meets that invitation for our existing and future operations, and we appreciate this conversation here. So as a threshold matter, as a water recycling program, we're not talking about drilling at all, not even for an injection well that we discussed last week. Construction of the facility will strictly follow all requirements, not only under this OGDP, but also of our concurrent pending construction permit with the Air Pollution Control Division. Also with this, um, the, uh, we have to apply for a federal Title V operating permit with US EPA, and of course, all of those requirements will be followed as well. We also point in your packet the forms 15 pit permit and 28 EMP waste permit that go along <clears throat> with this application. They've been meticulously crafted to give every aspect of environmental need its due and staff again has been fantastic in helping us 
uh, collaborate with that. So that being said, we recognize it's our burden to analyze public health, safety, welfare, environment, wildlife resources. So we will go directly into that. But first, I want to discuss why this location and how the BLM comes into play in this situation. Uh, this OGDP will service federal leases on federal lands, just like you heard from us last week. And we enjoy the dual level of oversight from both COGCC and BLM. We deployed extensive collaboration with BLM, the local field office, also the state office at the high level uh, with the RMP and NEPA. And truth be told, full transparency, that uh, environmental assessment that comes out of NEPA had some conditions of approval. Those conditions of approval are public. We fully intend to follow them. It's typically not, in my understanding, the COGCC's habit to have those from another agency inserted um, in, into COAs here, but if we can offer any assurances there to make sure those COAs are recognized, we are happy to do that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A rule 304B2 alternative location analysis was not required for the Pitcher's Mound water recycling facility. We obtained a waiver through the pre-application consultation process as required under 309E2 with CPW. However, this in no way should be interpreted as our thinking. There's a free pass regarding mule deer severe winter range and mule deer winter concentration under 1209D. As detailed in our wildlife mitigation plan that you may have had an opportunity to look at, this consultation resulted in Tara's decision to consolidate and reconfigure an existing location, implement six foot fencing around the entire location, construct wildlife ramps and trenches for deer where necessary, and probably most importantly, reduce traffic dramatically to curtail mortality. And more of this will be detailed in just a bit here, but it was important to make this note right now. So above all, we know BLM is supportive of this and we think it's another true win-win opportunity. This repurposed location is also important because we're moving less dirt, we're disturbing the environment less and making less impact on that deer concentration. So it's really um, 8.37 acres of new service disturbance and leveraging 10.31 of existing disturbance. <clears throat> And furthermore, we are proposing a reclamation program that will reclaim about 10 acres, 9.96 acres um, of service disturbance within six months after uh, construction is completed. So we're going to be left with a much smaller footprint of about 6.3 acres when all is said and done. In order to further assure transparency, I want to quickly uh, pivot here on the application itself that came to you as amended. You probably saw the bold type there. Most of the bold type revolves uh, acreage calculations. And that's why I think Ginger ahead of time, this is you know, kind of a, not a one-off, but you know, most of your OGDPs are kind of operational in nature with DSUs and, and a, a set number of wells that are being requested and not one that's more of an ancillary to operations like this. So our initial application was overly broad, overly inclusive in the amount of acreage that was presented. It was pared down to this 18.68. But the real upshot is, is that collaboration with permitting to set some standards as to how we calculate um, what is actual disturbance and what is the right amount of acreage to claim there. And you saw that in the injection well OGDP that actually was submitted near tandem with this one. So both had the benefits of that conversation. So huge thank to Sabrina's team. All right, so to public health, safety, welfare, environment, wildlife resources. It makes most sense in my mind to put public health and environment together. So to that point, the Pitchers Mound Water Recycling Facility introduces to the Piance Basin a proven program that maximizes the use of potential of water for the development of clean natural gas while reducing the predicted impacts to the environment. And under your rules, this is the first of its kind in this new rule paradigm. The Pitcher's Mound Water Recycling Facility is a major hub within a closed loop system that we discussed last week. TEP uh, projects that it will serve an additional 10 locations, so a little more than we told you last week on the fly, but it appears to be 10 locations over the building course of about 10 years also for a grand total of, let's call it plus or minus 300 modern wells. That federal injection well will serve as the terminus for safe disposal of that same water that's used several times, uh, but fundamentally this is EMP waste that we are maximizing the potential of. And in a practical sense, this closed system means that this will be a good model in the peons for the benefits of water recycling, 
Number two, it'll dramatically reduce fresh water usage. We represented to you last year, I can confirm in 2021, in this Ryan Gulch unit area, we used about 20% fresh water. With your approval of this today and with the implementation of it, that number is going to shoot up, or I'll tell you what you look at, at it. Produced water will shoot up to 99% fresh water, less than 1% for completion activities. And actually, truth be told, it's approaching 0% uh, fresh water because that remainder 1% is used in other required activities that are appropriate, such as pressure testing, dust mitigation, and the like. So a real healthy use of that water there. Other benefits, uh, reducing trucking from the point source. Last time we talked about reducing traffic from the well to the terminus, but now on the other end of things, and it's quite stark. For 2022, we're looking at 16,154 eliminated truck trips. That's over 1 million miles, which is about 4,042,000 pounds of CO2 not emitted from those diesel trucks. From then until 2024, we're looking at some 92,300 truck trips that would otherwise have been needed, 5.8 million miles or about 22 million pounds of CO2 reserved from the air and even larger from 2024 onwards, but we don't wanna project too far and, and get our dates crossed there. So um, a key component here is indeed the DAF unit, the dissolved uh, uh, unit, which means uh, oil is also removed before it gets to the facility, before that could be released. And this DAF uh, facility makes sure this, that the other emissions outside of the hydrocarbons are reduced by half. And so that oil removal process removes 95% of the hydrocarbons and condensate and biological treatment removes the other remaining trace amounts to non-detect levels. So we're very proud of that process and that technology and that major reduction in emissions. Um, again, we'll point you to forms 15 and 28 for uh, more details there. And but lastly, for public health and environment, the location itself, it is consistent with adjacent land uses. There's really not much going out there. There are nine oil and gas locations within a 1.12 mile radius. But otherwise, we kind of are out in the middle of nowhere, minimal visual impact, out of sight, et cetera. And so, as we said before, real quickly, we participated with AQCC rulemakings. We are involved in the EPA rulemaking, so we know that we're sharing uh, the best technology we can and not being tone deaf to the larger conversations that are going on uh, regarding emissions and gas development. Next, safety and welfare. And real briefly here, happy to report the OGLA found no particular items of concern for the application. It is our practice to make sure that dust, sound, light, always mitigated in the middle of nowhere. If you're driving through the middle of nowhere, you want it to be a pleasant experience, not get blinded and mitigate those impacts against wildlife as well. We're not near population centers um, and we have been in touch with Rio Blanco to make sure that the roads are used properly and that sort of thing. Last major point for me, wildlife resources in more detail. Um, very importantly, the location and infrastructure for this Pitchers Mound water recycling facility, they're pre-existing. So we're proud that we can recycle, if you will, again, uh, the actual location for, for good use. Not as much dirt being turned up and less disrupted to wildlife. Mule deer do present as the issue here. It's the greatest opportunity for partnering with you so we can establish the, mess, the best mitigation efforts here. So our plan then in consultation um, with Mr. Elm, with uh, CPW, is I think above all, to, to quote Mr. Duranlo, actually, this hierarchy of impacts, the avoidance. At the end of the day, all those truck trips are the biggest problem for mule deer. And we're avoiding, you know, from 2022 through to 2024, a total of 108,000 trips. And so mortality for deer is project projected to be um, avoided in, in a real and important way. Next, the water recycling facility is enclosed by a six foot fencing all around. The arrangement of the reuse location means that, um, <clears throat> that when we reclaim that portion, there's gonna be less impact to that concentration area for the deer as well. The ramps and the trenches, of course, will be an important accommodation and will be in constant communication with CPW, BLM on the proper timing and installation of those. More than just deer though, uh, bird netting will secure the entirety of the open portions uh, of the water recycling facility. 
it's not enough just to put a netting. We need to make sure the netting is actually working. So we have a formal and informal way of making sure that it's secure. There will be daily inspection by the person from Terra who is on site, make sure that netting is in place and is um, <clears throat> not developing any holes or the like. Weekly and more formal inspections by TEP staff, so part of that person's checklist to, to make sure that is in place. And then more informally, there is a third party going out monthly for stormwater inspections, and we will see that this can be part of that look as well, and alerting us to any uh, updates to that knitting that need to be done. Okay, not wild, but livestock, also animals, they require a protection piece. So to that end, we are planning to use um, as most appropriate either cattle uh, fencing gates um, and or cattle guards as appropriate, some free range there. Our consultations and ongoing conversations with BLM, CPW, but also Rio Blanco ensure we are not making this an afterthought. And we always expect to keep those conversations going and invite any insight you might have too. So I now would like to reintroduce Mr. Jeff Kirtland, Regulatory Manager for TEP Rocky Mountain, address a few questions presented by you all and give some more color to the development of this program. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mr. Kirtland. Good afternoon, commissioners. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and again, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And uh, uh, as, as I did last week, uh, uh, I want to just thank you for, for providing us some questions. And, and uh, if you'll indulge, I'll, I'll just review those questions quickly and then uh, be happy to, to provide some responses. And I think that would probably be a good segue in, into uh, additional questions if, if that's workable for you, uh, Mr. Chair. That's fine. Great. Uh, so the first question really is, can TEP explain if there is any connection between the recently approved Fed 299 injection well, Mott's Ranch, and the proposed Pitcher's Mount EMP treatment facility? All seems to address produced water treatment and reuse. Could treatment be consolidated at the proposed Pitcher's Mount, or is it uh, too far away from Mott's Ranch and the injection well? Um, and then, uh, you know, really, there's a concern in that question about topography and sort of the distance and sort of then what's sort of the difference between the Mott's Ranch facility and, and what will occur at Pitcher's Mound? Uh, and, and thank you for those questions, commissioners. Uh, you know, I'm happy to explain that, that really the connection between Pitcher's Mound and the recently approved injection well uh, and, the, um, and the additional facilities uh, uh, really have to do with, with our, our development that is expanding into the federal leasehold in, in Rio Blanco County. And, and eff effectively what we're doing is we're adding on to existing infrastructure, which allows us to, to manage, recycle, produce water uh, throughout the field more safely and efficiently. Um, if you recall back in October, we shared with you a lot of information about <clears throat> the inner workings of our water management systems. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, specific to Ryan Gulch, we, we have over 110 miles of existing pipelines that are connecting uh, well pads and water uh, management uh, infrastructure throughout the east, west, sort of north, south part of that field. Um, and, and of course, that in and of itself allows us to be able to, to uh, move water from one point of the field to the other point without trucking it through pipes that we can monitor and manage more safely. <clears throat> um, so with, with Pitcher's Mound, of course, that is now a, uh, a hub, if you will, to that existing uh, uh, infrastructure. And, and as necessary, as we move north into our development to have storage and, and the availability for that storage uh, as our new development uh, occurs. And really the foresight and the construction of, of uh, the, the existing um, pipelines which was really something we inherited from the prior operator who was looking and had the foresight to develop uh, in that area, uh, allows us to, to uh, really manage the, the water that is one being produced by the, the wells that are currently uh, producing as well as new wells that are, that are planned. So again, that, that specifically removes all of the truck traffic, allows us for safe, safe handling. Um, you know, additionally, our ability to centrally locate, I think I kind of alluded to that, but by having the ability to centrally locate Pitcher's Mound within our, our uh, existing infrastructure um, allows us the flexibility then to 
manage water from one side of the field to the other, as well as access our uh, injection field. So the injection well that you approved last week uh, does have um, pipelines that, that uh, are accessible to uh, the pitcher's mound, as well as the uh, Mott's Ranch facility as well. Now, in terms of differentiating between Mott's Ranch and the, the pitcher's mound, um, you know, I think the biggest difference is, is the uh, addition of the dissolved air flotation or the DAF. Um, and and uh, otherwise, you know, the separation that uh, takes place at MOTS is similar to uh, the treatment processes that, that'll take place uh, at Pitcher's Mound as well. Um, I think last week, I, and if you recall in October, I talked a lot about our water technology, water processing technology, and how we manage hydrocarbons within the pits. Uh, so I'll kind of work backwards. Uh, we, we use biology, the bugs, if you will, sort of uh, to uh, consume the, the trace amounts of hydrocarbons. And of course, that's, that's uh, in play with all of our facilities, whether it's the Mott's Ranch, uh, this facility, our, our facilities in, in uh, Parachute and Rulison, and, all our, and the majority of our ponds throughout our, our asset. But the, really, the, the biggest difference is, is the introduction of the DAF. And, and I will say that we have two DAFs that are operating in the, uh, the field that's south of this in, in Garfield County, this would be the first DAF that will be operational in Rio Blanco County. So this allows us to really expand the technology and expand our ability to more effectively treat and then recycle water as, as we're seeing a, an increase of development in, in Rio Blanco. So, you know, TEP recognizes that, that, you know, the environmental and operational benefits of the DAF in newer facilities such as Pitcher Mound, but obviously we're gonna continue to shepherd technologies that, that have been successfully utilized in our existing facilities like, like Mott's Ranch. So ho hopefully that sort of got to your, your questions um, and allowed us to uh, give you a little more information about, about Pitcher's Mound. Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you, Mr. Kirkland, for that uh, additional information. I think what I was trying to get at was, it, it appears to me that both the Mouths Ranch and the proposed Pitcher's Mound are, are um, treatment and recycling facilities. Am I, okay, okay. Yes. So, um, I, I'm not sure how big Mouths Ranch is, but was it also a Title V permitted facility? I believe all, all of our pits are uh, eventually uh, to be permitted under Title V. Um, and is that because um, tons per year of VOCs that will be emitted? I, I, I mean, believe, a, Title yeah. v, a Title V is a significant amount of emissions. That's why you're having to to go that extra modeling sure. and air air emissions oversight by CDPHE and then approval by EPA, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, so my, I guess my question was, they seem, they seem rather close to me and why could there be consolidation and just either use of the pitcher's mound with the new technology and it, it would absorb some of the work and or um, function of the Mouths Ranch, or I guess my question, my, those second questions, right? Are they too far away? Does the topography not work for that? It seems to me that there might be an opportunity for some consolidation here, but I, maybe there were some limitations that I didn't understand. Th thank you for the, the questions and, and, and for the clarification. And, and, and really there's, there's two pieces at play. Yes, they are at separate ends of, the, of our uh, development field. Uh, and uh, the volume of the current facilities do not adequately support our future development. We, to, to effectively recycle and manage the water for future development, we need additional storage capacity. Uh, and, and so Pitcher's Mound allows us to do that. Uh, what, what, we're what we're attempting to do in the design of Pitcher's Mound is to go above and beyond through newer technologies like the DAF. Mott's Ranch is a much older facility. Um, it certainly employs technologies that are uh, improving in terms of, of managing and treating uh, hydrocarbons. You know, frankly, we're, we're, we're wanting to remove hydrocarbons from produced water 
uh, for, for multiple reasons. Obviously the, the environmental benefits, but uh, there, there's a cost uh, and revenue associated with those hydrocarbons. So it's in our best interest to work toward removing hydrocarbons uh, from, from the, uh, the produced water that we manage. And, and frankly, we're required to do that un, under CDPHE permits as well. So, but to your question about consolidation, uh, is, uh, it really is far apart, the, you know, w without necessarily having a, a good visual here, um, the, you know, they're, they're in different townships, uh, several miles uh, of sections away. And uh, frankly, the, the new development that we're targeting uh, requires this additional storage to be able to manage and, and effectively recycle water for, uh, for that development. Okay, so I, I think, I think I, what I hear you saying is there's a capacity issue. You wouldn't be able to just use one facility, that, which is why you're having to build a second and not either add on to the Miles Ranch and update it or retire the Miles Ranch and just use Pitcher's Mound with the new technology and the lower emissions, if I'm understanding. But, but I do hear you saying that the pitcher's mound will um, use the injection well that we just approved, the federal 299 for injection of um, produced water that you can't use for recycling. Well, and, and for, thank you for that clarification, uh, Commissioner McGowan. And, and, and frankly, the Think of this as a closed loop system where you've got miles of pipeline and hubs of, of, uh, of pits effectively storing and being able to manage and treat water from one side uh, of the, the basin to the other. All of that is, is connected and all of those pits, all of that water is able to be uh, transported to a single location where we are uh, uh, injecting water. Um, so the, the, the injection well that you just approved is in the southwest portion of our field and is accessible from Moss Ranch. It's accessible and will be accessible from the pitcher's mound. So the, and, and that, that's, as, as uh, Mr. Yule uh, alluded to, uh, that's the terminus of where water that we cannot recycle would go to be um, uh, effectively uh, uh, injected and disposed of. But because we've got these pits uh, that allow us to transport water and, and treat water, that, that's what's, that is what facilitates our ability to more effectively recycle water between the field. So, yeah. you, so as, as water is being produced and, and used for uh, hydraulic fracturing operations, that water then is being recycled uh, and treated for, the, for use. So the, the molecule of water isn't being used once in fracking and, and then going down hole for injection, we might reuse that molecule of water from one pit to the next, depending on, on uh, you know, where, where the development's requirements are located. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I appreciate the explanation because I, I was kind of, I'm, I'm appreciative of re reduction of truck traffic, uh, being able to pipe everything instead of you know, traffic going back and forth. Um, I'm appreciative of the recycling aspect and because that, it, that was something that we really focused on during mission change and in the statement basis of purpose. Um, the trifecta would be if you would be able to consolidate some of your facilities with the updated technology. So I was kind of hoping that that would be somewhere on the map, but um, I'm, this is very helpful to me and kind of puts the whole picture together. So thank you. Mr. McGowan, may I add just a touch? Go ahead. The the uh, the Mounts the Mounts Ranch facility was permitted. Don't hold me to this, but I think January 2011, which seems so long ago, but it seems like yesterday at the same time. But this is the first application that Terra has on this asset, apart from its predecessor. And the first application will be to make sure we're employing all these technologies that were a little more nascent, even just 10, 11 years ago. And plus, that closed loop system, as Jeff was saying too. Um, that is the benefit of a larger operator with the investment in all the piping is that, yeah, you might have more emissions at this spot. We're not hiding that, but those emissions at any rate are far cumulatively lower than if you're smaller, don't have the pipeline infrastructure, and that's getting emitted every time you open the well for the water to go in and out. So from that aspect, I, I think you have our word. We're doing everything we can to make sure we're clamping down that mitigation. And if it were my client developing this 10 years ago, I mean, that consolidation would have been 
you know, automatic, but, but thank you for those, those comments. Other commissioners with questions? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jewell, Mr. Kirtland for being here today and presenting uh, on this application. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, Clarifications, really. Um, the the BLM permit, and understand it was a permit for a, a master plan development, but um, it did have a condition of approval on this particular site around uh, uh, timing restrictions for construction, not only initial construction, but um, any, any construction that would occur on an ongoing basis or during I understand it's a pit, but I'm just going to call it to say production. Um, and so, um, some of the BMPs in that, that were that were considered in the COGC COGDP application um, certainly included timing restrictions for that initial construction, but didn't go as far as to say any ongoing construction. Um, can I just assume that because the BLM permit would require it, that that would be something that that would also happen under the COGCC permit? You could, yes, sir. And as I alluded to before, uh, we traditionally just kind of kept those parallel with each agency. And uh, I mean, I can tell you that certainly we, we have the BLM to account for for those COAs, but um, if there's any way we can abridge that with you and supplement, we're happy to, to make sure that's aware or that we're aware of that and make that more obvious in the record. But, but yes, sir, to your question, you, you can rest assured of that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to create that parallel so that there isn't any confusion between the two permits because I think that's just easier for our inspectors, you know, as we look at things going forward so they don't have to determine was that a BLM requirement, was that a COGCC requirement, so that's why I ask on that one. Um, I mean, and even to the construction and reclamation bit, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, in my notes that about three months after the construction is done, but of course that depends on BLM's giving us the green light, you know, the, the latest blizzard, that sort of thing. But that's our best crystal ball guess is, you know, six months after that, we're, we're looking at folding that whole location back another 9.9 .9 acres. Right. My only other question um, would be uh, actually for, for Mr. Elm um, from CPW, and I wonder if we could elevate him. Um, I, I'm just going to ask a few questions, and Mr. Jewell, Mr. Kirtley, you're certainly welcome to chime in on this as well, but um, understanding that there was a waiver of the alternative location analysis, um, but also, you know, having read your submittals, it, it, it was clear to me that some alternative location analysis was done in determining that this would be an appropriate site and that other sites may not be as appropriate as this particular site. And understanding that it, as a commissioner, it's my responsibility to ultimately decide if that waiver of the alternative location analysis is is appropriate or not um and not having i think enough information in the application i wonder if mr elm you would just kind of go through kind of your your analysis and that in that initial consultation with um tep in determining that that this was the appropriate location and that other locations were not to be considered yeah thank you commissioner messner and um for the record my name is Taylor and I'm on the energy liaison for CPW in the Northwest corner of the state. Um, and yeah, you're correct. There was um, a, a lot of discussions and consultations going back quite a ways on this location with BLM and kind of part of that uh, development of the master development plan for BLM and the EA. Um, I realize, uh, you know, more so now that as commissioners, you don't kind of have access or you know, the history of some of those discussions and kind of at a disadvantage for um, not being there and participating in some of those. But uh, that really kind of was the impetus for waiving the ALA was we kind of worked through the process essentially with BLM and, you know, part of their NEPA process is analyzing uh, alternatives and, and other locations. And so, we had a lot of those discussions on site. Uh, CPW staff was present for the on sites with BLM and with the operator. And at the end of the day, for a lot of the reasons that Mr. Jewell and, and Mr. Kirtland explained, this location just kind of seemed like the no brainer given the pipeline infrastructure that's already in place, given 
the access road was already going to be there. Um, also, that they can utilize uh, to a large part kind of an existing pad surface and reduce disturbance. And so, um, th that really is was kind of the factors that that weighed in um, to that decision to waive the ALA based on the presence of high priority habitat. Commissioner Messner, you're muted. Yes, I just realized that. Um, um, I, thanks, thanks for that response. That was super helpful. Um, was there discussions about um, well density and permeability, uh, or, or is that not a consideration necessarily in that mule deer winter range? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it comes into account as we kind of assess those indirect impacts associated with it, and whether we're kind of within that um, that that limit between one per square mile and exceeding five per square mile. So that was analyzed as Mr. Jewell indicated. Um, there's, there's nine active oil and gas locations, I believe within a 1.12 or yeah, 1.12 mile buffer from the location, which is kind of the methodology for determining that. Um, I will say, point out that in addition to the active oil and gas locations, there's some fairly extensive disturbance north of this location that's associated with the natural soda plant and development of, uh, or uh, production of, of natural soda. And based on the, the reading of the rule language in the 1200 series and under 1203, 1203 it's very clear that uh, the density applies to oil and gas locations. And so we did not add the well pads for the natural soda plant uh, into that, but essentially there is, some fairly extensive disturbance kind of to the north of this location, which factored in at the end of the day as well to the um, indirect impact assessment. Great, thank you very much. That was super helpful and I appreciate you being here. You bet. Thank Further you, questions for the panel? Any wrap up, Mr. Jewell? Uh, no, sir. Then just to conclude, you know, we're looking at public health, safety, welfare, environment, and particularly wildlife resources uh, in this regard. And I would just add as a closure to what Mr. Elm said, you know, getting this out of completely out of ALA territory would get you also outside of the pipeline infrastructure. So the amount of dirt turning, among other things, would be very substantial. So uh, I appreciate his independent analysis there. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your time and attention and supporting our efforts here to, to keep doing what's best. Thank you. All right, there are no further questions. I believe we now move into deliberation stage. Would anyone care to initiate deliberation? Commissioner McGowan, by a hair. Going first. Um, so I, you know, I, I'll just repeat what I said when I was having the conversation with Mr. Kirtland, which was, um, I, I'm appreciative of the way the facility is set up. It's going to reduce truck traffic emissions. It's, um, recycling water instead of having to use fresh water, which is a priority for the commission and something that we emphasized. Um, and I think that, you know, it's going to go through some further review and additional permitting, um, and other sets of eyes will be on it. So um, I will support this application. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for your thoughts there, Commissioner McGowan. I would agree. I think, um, I mean, I think that, again, I think this application had lots of good information in it, uh, particularly once again, like the plan of development document that helps encapsulate, uh, encapsulate all of the kind of information that I would expect to see in the application um, in, in other documents. And so that's a, that's a helpful document for me. Um, and uh, I do appreciate the recycled water component to this, the connected infrastructure, the lack of, um, or the minimization of truck traffic. Um, you know, I think particularly because it's on federal land. I always appreciate reading the environmental analysis that's associated with these as uh, lots of information in there. Um, and uh, appreciate Mr. Elms um, 
comments regarding the analysis that was done um, to determine to waive the alternative location analysis. I will note that because the NEPA process, the environmental assessment process does require some level of uh, ALA um, that it may help uh, just to include an alternative location analysis, even if there is a clear location that makes the most sense uh, just to, um, I guess, not have to answer these questions um, in the in the review process, uh, not only from commission, but from any stakeholders that may be interested in future sites, um, but certainly not required. Certainly CPW has the ability to waive that. You know, I think it was uh, after hearing Mr. Elms responses today, I think it was an appropriate um, decision in, in this particular situation. So um, I would support this application. Further discussion, further deliberations, do we have a motion? I'll move to approve the application. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hold on just a second. Does Karen look aye. frozen? Oh, there she is. I heard an aye. Okay, the motion carries and the application for the OGDP is approved. Thank you both. Thank you, Commissioners. And thank particularly you very much. Allen and Messner, that feedback's helpful so we know how to frame future applications. So thank you very much for that detailed response. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Okay, Commissioners. Um, I have um, news. Um, docket number 2112 was continued off of the agenda for today, tomorrow, to likely May 4th. So we have concluded our business of today and we do not uh, have any business for tomorrow. So, so I am looking for a motion to adjourn today. And um, yeah, that's it. I move so to moved. adjourn. Second. Second. We have multiple motions and multiple seconds. All those in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, great work, everybody. Great work to all of our stakeholders. Thanks for being there, in particular for the high priority habitat uh, rulemaking. And um, we will see you in another year on that front. And then we'll see you next week uh, as we continue to do the business of Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission.